Hello and welcome to Varnblog and friend of the show, musicologist and one of the many hosts of The Measures Taken, Stefan Hamill, uh, is here with us today. Also, my favorite unwoke Marxist humanist, um, <laughs> since uh, you got, you are not uh, uh, down with the, with the identity politics enough. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Marxist post-humanist, uh, but that's too many hyphens, so we're going to have to come up with a different name. All right. Um, I wanted to talk to you about Western Marxism, but I also wanted to talk to you about the whole concept. Um, Western Marxism has been used for a while. Now it means something even more different in China, which basically just means non-Chinese Marxist. Um, but... Yeah. In the context of the United States, it's had a very particular sort of of ring, particularly after the 1960s. Um, and since you've gone through, you know, the the rise and fall of the Second International over there, and the measures taken, mm -hmm. um, starting with well, the beginning of things. And ending with the ABCs of communism, which is the end of things. Um, <laughs> my favorite, my favorite text too, by the way, um, and for the same reason you articulated, uh, the best program and the worst joining points that ever existed in the history of communism. It's yeah. Like... <laughs> that thing should be read by everybody, by the way. So th those those in the listeners, you know, those among the listeners who have not made their way through the ABCs of communism, just make it through the program. It's going to give you new life. But the the 21 conditions are also going to make you go. Nobody could join this without splitting their organization into into tiny fractions. So happily, my edition of the of ABC is uh, doesn't include the twenty conditions or really any mention of it. Um, so it's it's gracefully neutered in that way um, yeah. from from its actual actual you know instantiation. So I've actually wondered this. Do you know who wrote the act? I know that you know Bukharin and Preobajensky. Preobajensky wrote the program more or yeah. less um and it's also important that even though we associate Bukharin with the right op oppositionist he's actually at this time considered from the left almost oppositionist ring of the party he's also the person who kept on reminding uh Lenin passive aggressively that like there was commitments in state and revolution that he wasn't doing <laughs> uh, so <laughs> You know, he like published this whole big endorsement of state and revolution in their like one <laughs> newspaper that the left faction of the Bolsheviks got out. Um, and I think, I think people will be amazed because they associate, we associate communism now with, with Dungism or, you know, the Stalinist mm -hmm. period of Marxist Leninism or, the Brezhnevian period of Marxist Leninism, or even the kind of slightly cooler Khrushchevian period of Marxist Leninism, um, that that we forget how radical those initial demands really were. They were far more radical than even what a lot of left communists demand now. Um, yeah, you know, more than the radicality, I agree that they're really radical, um, especially especially as you say, uh, when compared to what we normally think of when we think of official communism. And there's no greater expression of official communism than the first program of the of the you know Soviet Communist Party. At the same time, the entire document is focused on the transference of power by means of the party, but really by whatever means necessary toward the goal, which is Soviet democracy or a council democracy. That's the beating heart of the whole document. Now, you know, it gets uh, it, it gets complicated after that, but it's important also to remember how contemporary some of these concerns are. I mean, we were having a debate in the United States, a constant debate about revolutionary strategy, and the mainstream is still committed to the use of state power in fixing the inequality pro yeah, problem, however that's conceived. And it's just clear that the first generation of Soviet leaders had no intention of using the state power to do anything but transfer the functions of the state to a more radical form of democracy. So it also seems to me, along with being radical, it's also contemporary. You don't need to edit very much about it in order to endorse it. Today. Yeah, that, that's the funny thing about that program is when I went through my... Uh, do, you, do you know the story? So many, many years ago, 
2015, I sat down with this group called the Reb Party, and I was asked, I was actually tasked by a bunch of Magnarite neocouts. Um, back when that word meant something a little bit more specific than it does now. Um, to go through all the programs that I could get my hands on. Um, and all the schemas that I could get my hands on. You know, we started with the great, with the classic ones, Trotskyist transitional programs, the various Trotskyist groups' interpretations of those transitional programs, the uh, various left communist platforms, the official communist party programs, particularly after the 1940s, uh, the British... Uh, the British Communist Party's both version, like both the Provisional Committee and the and the MLs, um, we I went through something like 250 programs, and then I was like, I got my Road to Power and my Effort program, and I got my ABCs of Communism, and I'm like, well, most of what we need is still in here, um, particularly in the ABCs of Communism. The only thing that I was stuck on um, was what would be immediate, what would be minimum, and what would be transitional, which was this way that we were viewing our, our program schema. Mm -hmm. uh, the maximum program, I I, I am, you know, it, particularly back then, I was very much of like, we have a positive vision, we have principles, but no one's laying out a fucking maximum program. Like, that's, that's blueprints, man. <laughs> like... Um, <laughs> That's right. There ought to be a maximum program. In fact, if there isn't a concrete vision of the future, communism has no no way to enter into into people's subjective commitments. Um, right. Yeah, we need a picture. But that picture, I, I have to insist, I mean, that picture has to be one that is two things at the same time. On the, on the one hand, it has to be the case that whatever picture of the future, it's not just more just, it's also more prosperous. And the second is that it has to be worth a certain degree of material sacrifice in the near term in order for that full flowering of, you know, of productive energies and of the, you know, manifesting of human freedom and its, in, in its full expression, right, uh, in a plentiful society gets, you know, uh, ends up coming around. So it's got to be both desirable, concrete, and about a better form of life and not just something more moral or just or desirable in that way. Right. This is actually kind of interesting to me because I am I have come around to the idea that there needs to be a communist justice, but uh, I want it to be way more material than the bullshit we tell the children that most forms of justice are. So... <laughs> Um, and I don't want it to be revenge. Like that's that's the other thing that like justice often really is, uh, <laughs> even for communists. So it's it's important for me to like reground that. I also I am trying to get out of these stupid growth to growth debates. So I'm glad to use the term prosperity because I'm like I don't even know what economic growth means in a communist society exactly. Like. That's like, right. It's not GDP. So, you know, but the the other thing is I think people will be surprised by this. Um, I tend to be one of these people who will not pin down terms because I do accept the general linguistic give them as people use a term a certain way. It is what it fucking means, whether I like it or not. However, <laughs> my my minimum standard for what communism is, not socialism. And I, I and I, I realize that left communists will sometimes get me, they're like, well, Marx only uses that framework once and it's in the framework of Ritik and LaSalle and the armchair socialists and the German historicist school. And I'm like, yeah, it's true, but he also does use it. And then Lenin uses it and everybody else uses it. Uh, so I think we, that communism is a classless society. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can, we we might define that slightly less absolutely than anarchist, because anarchist. But when I hear stuff like, well, there's still social categories, or maybe even caste, but there's no longer exploitation, so there's no class. And I'm like, just quoting Lenin at people and being like, yeah, that class class class, class distinction based off of legality yeah. uh, is. It's a little bit in Trotsky. It is. He he uses those words kind of loosely, and he does kind of refer to caste as legal. But both Lenin and Marx don't make that distinction, and Lenin's explicit about it. 
Um, Lenin, yeah. said, you know, Lenin actually defines class primarily as a legal distinction in addition to an exploitation one, which might be a problem in and of itself. But that's, but it it is actually quite interesting. Uh, the way I think a lot of quote communist or socialist today uh, want to denude the higher vision of any content, including the basic fucking definition, which was a classless society where all hierarchies are provisional and role based and can be recalled and everybody has equal, like, right. Like, you know, one of the biggest things about, it's not that there wouldn't be self-defense in a communist society, but like, you can't have a fucking standing army. Lenin says that. That's not like some love comp. That's a state and revolution. Oh, no, so, I don't. I mean, you know, I have a kind of like 19th century Swiss vision of this, which is, right. uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there has to be self-defense in a communist society because there's a difference between um, ownership of the means of production, the relevant means of production, not all means of production in the abstract, just those that the uh, progress of capitalism has brought into socialized production already. So, for example, there's never going to be a communism that, uh, you know, uh, by which the labor of tying shoes in society is socialized. That will always be a matter of personal responsibility. That's an exaggerated case. Um, but it's got to be just those uh, areas of human production in producing daily life that includes all kinds of necessities, maybe even the majority of necessities if they're quantifiable. Um, and it just turns out to be the case that they're more efficiently run by, by councils. Those councils will probably be something like tenants workers councils or something but they can't be limited to the individual firm um that seems yeah, this is like my a... pushback on co-ops because i'm like individual oh, yeah. firm based co-ops are not going to be good enough even i actually say even under socialism because because and i made this point to pascal robert and he didn't respond to me but <laughs> but uh i i told him if a firm is owned even truly owned by its workers but that firm is only owned by the workers who work in that firm. The proletariat as a whole does not own that firm. And, and that, and I, I can't get people to get that. I'm like, that's, that's important. Like, yes, there are many ways in which syndicates and stuff might be something that we would use to base this off of. And, could, but those, the, the co-op would have to be answerable to the council. Like, because we have to, so you want, you want plant, you want planned. Um, however, you, and uh, there's a variety of ways of doing the planning. Like, that's right. why I study systems, cybernetic theory, complexity theory. I realize that Marx has never worked that out, but you want a planned economy that is also not super fragile. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you cannot have firms only looking out for their individual interest. No, yeah. Look, Tillamook is not my vision of communism. Uh, you know, that, that's that dairy that's that's you know owned and operated by workers. Not not that that isn't a part of the labor movement historically. It is a part of the labor movement. It's in, in fact, it's it's even. I'll go as far as to say an organic form of the class. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's lots of things. I'm of two minds about co-ops. Actually, on the one hand. I think that I think all of what you think about them, which is that they're they're no kind of model for the transition, and uh, they will have to be subordinated to, uh, if they exist at all, they'll have to be subordinated uh, to to councils that are political um, and are able to do that more general form of organization. On the other hand, where we've seen some experiments with uh, with co-ops, especially in those instances where co-ops are linked to one another in supply chain-like fashion, I think that there's an argument to be made that that's a kind of transitional form and that at some moment it will be clear to all those involved that the democratic structure that runs their firm is much more efficiently manifest as a democratic structure that self, you know, self-governs supply chains. Um, right. So I don't, I'm not like, I'm not so- I'm not anti-co-op co either. I use, in my, in my more- in my more dogmatic left calm days in my in my early 30s, I, I was like, bleh, Madrigan, spit, spit, spit. But um <laughs> that's right, because it's about purity of thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now I now I do think it's important. I'm also, you know, uh I've never it's funny because I had to justify that by the fact that I've never been an anti-union left communist. I've never taken the total anti-union line ever. 
Um, even though I like agree with most of the critiques of communist makes of unions and anarchist makes of unions. Um, but I'm like, it's literally the only form of workers organization that currently exists. So like, uh, you know, um, other than like, I guess guilds or something. And I, I have really based my thought on co-ops. Like my thought around unions is like they're subpar, but they are part of this chain. It's good to advocate for them. It also teaches workers that they can actually do this shit on their own. Um, Absolutely. And and one of the things you pointed about the ABC is the communism. I didn't think about it when I first read it, but I've been, you know, I've been for years talking about, okay, well, let's talk about cybernetics. Let's talk about the Codonis. Uh, you know, not because like Allende's government was actually particularly great. I actually don't think that. In fact, or left wing. Yeah. Um, it just happened. The socialists happened to be slightly more left wing than the communist in Chile, which is a funny thing. Um, well, that, that gets replicated around the world, not just Chile, but but anyway. Right, yeah, that that that's uh, we do have to bring good old Khrushchev for that. Um, but furthermore, it was weird because it self defense was a group that was a, technically outside of it, hmm. um, which was the Guevarist. <laughs> so it was like, uh, <laughs> so the Guevarists right. were defending the Chile, like. Like the the Javeras were the parastate institution that was really fighting to defend the state, a state that they I didn't actually support, but that they didn't want overthrown by rightist, um, which right. which put it in this incredibly untenable position. And then I'm like, and they were afraid to do any of the stuff they were doing in radical democratization and information sharing. And I don't just mean Cyber Center, what or what Stafford Beer brought in, although that's important. The Cardonas worked independently of that. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't do it to the fucking army. So which, which the Bolsheviks actually realized you had to do. So there's a great film about the days. It's a Chilean film made mm. about the, the day of the coup and it follows Allende himself. And uh, you know what we, what the writers imagined would be his last series of conversations. And of course they're all helpfully uh, l- reflective, clear sighted and philosophical. And at one moment, the Allende character um beautifully articulates, I think, what the historical Allende um, held dear, which was that the best revolution in history was the French Revolution. That is the, the what produced, you know, a modern state. And the standing army is, in the last instance, the, the you know, the full expression of the self-defense of that state, the state that was supposed to bring about a more equitable society, perhaps through some version of cyber sin or something else. I, I don't think, I mean, that was one of the basic tensions in, the, in that Chetland, you know, truncated revolutionary process, which there's a, there, in fact, there's a good scene in, I keep referring to films, I don't know why, uh, but in the Battle of Chile, where you know, workers' councils are negotiating with representatives of the Allende regime, trying to decide when it would be that the Allende regime would real would wake up and realize that they needed to start this transference of power process. And it was clear that 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 the Allende people they they had no intention of doing that. In fact, it ran right right in smack dab into their their concept of of a successful, more efficient, and prosperous socialist Chile. Right. This is. I am constantly surprised about the substitutions of basic frameworks of communism um, from Marx, but not just from Marx. I mean, some of these some of these traditions are far older than Marx. Like, for you know, as everyone who's studied their um, critique of the Goethe Prep, we should know from each of their own ability, each of their own need isn't even Marx. That's just like the communist goal going all the way back to the French. Yeah. Um, and and. I admit there's this stuff about um, bourgeois society in that that parts of it are left in the socialist thing. And I and I hate that it's worded that way because it's pretty clear that what he's referring to is time accounting. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it gets taken as markets compensating people by uh, compensating people by skills. In fact. I, I, I've had Mar- Marxists swear to me that it means compensated people for value added. And I'm like, there's no fucking such thing as value added, even in socialism. No, but, and nothing in capital suggests that's not what it means to produce surplus value. It isn't value added in, in the way that it's normally conceived of. Not no. that there's any of that going on, even in the bourgeois conception of the of the economy. We're, we're living through very cool time. It, look, look. If you're a more or less t- like t- technologically determinist, cold stream, economistic Marxist, this is a great day to be alive. 
I mean, in this new transition. <laughs> so this is this is the, both the greatest and worst simultaneously because this is the next, this is the next hinge point. Yeah, um, I really believe it is. Really believe it is. Um, whether or not we get the the sixth mutation of capitalism or not, it's really sort of at, and I'm counting six mutations. There might be more, but like, hey, what are your six? Just out of curiosity, I've got like four. I got. I actually consider early mercantilism a, a phase of capital, and I consider it real. So that's there's that mercantile okay. accumulation, uh, agrarian capital, industrial capital, um, then uh, entre entrepreneurial capital, which is a misnomer, but you know what I mean. It's a period from like 1850 to like uh 1910 the class the, the period in which marxism actually develops most of his theories and which the first yeah. two volumes of capital most reflect the world um like directly they still reflect the world now don't i'm not one of these people who's like capital is no longer useful chuck it out like xi jinping is but um uh, no i know what you mean it's the trains you know it's the it's, from yeah 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 so and and how inefficient the trains are and you have that's when you start seeing uh the real 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 bubbles i mean there's th there's bubbles in the economy all the way back to the 1640s but you, you see real ones yeah um in the 1850s 60s 70s um then we have the end of the heroic period uh then we have the rising and uh, of imperialism our state capital generally mm -hmm. which morphs into Keynesian social democracy and Fordism, depending on where you're at. And those are closer than people want to admit. Um, then you have the decline of that and what Mandel called late capital optimistically from the 60s into the 70s. Um, and then you have neoliberalism's rise from like 76 into probably 1999, 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. Um, then you have neoliberalism's decline and very rapid decline into what I, I think, you know, everyone's naming it in hindsight, got all the techno neo feudal theses, which I think are stupid, oh. uh, but also uh, what um, someone like Hudson calls it new finance capitalism. I think Brenner's now calling it political capital. Which oh, he also get me started on that article. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm about to do a whole series on my solo show about like, there are pieces of brilliance in that article which they didn't stomp on. It's actually it's actually more frustrating that there's actually a couple of insights in it like than if it was total shit. But yes, but but we, you, we know all we, we've seen this rentierization of the economy in the second in the second half of neoliberalism mm -hmm. um and that's, you know, I guess that's actually more than six because I have subcategories, but they actually pretty roughly follow also like two to three business cycles a piece. Mm -hmm. um, they all have a crisis point, although admittedly entrepreneurial capital has like 85 crisis. There's so many fucking recessions and depressions. It was like every two years. But like, that was part of its stability, right? You 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 put that right in the in the 1850s, which is right in that moment in which Marx is lamenting that there isn't so much that, you know, that clatter dutch on the horizon. And for that reason, he has to go and he has to, you know, pay attention to, to, to the writing of political economy, et cetera. Um, it, it seems to me that it's precisely the suppression of of naturally occurring waves <laughs> that has caused this boom bust cycle and i don't know man i don't know how we unravel qe without without destroying the the just the conditions for a governable society yeah particularly when they want to do stuff they want to unravel qe they want to raise them they want to but they want to also save the banks but they want to raise unemployment but they want they want to reshore because the supply chains are breaking down literally their demands are impossible with their own demands and the uh, and and whether or not it's a democrat or a republican office they're going to be working at odds with the fed uh and everybody knows it and okay. it's but you know it, it's uh i mean i think it's gonna be really hard when the supreme court gets rid of that meager ass student loan forgiveness and they're just Right. forking money out for banks and also cutting food stamps and everything else 
uh, for that's the intention. I imagine that that's the, the political intention, which is I mean, look, they're they're caught within a rock in a hard place. I really do think capitalism more or less ended ten years ago, and and it's just been floated since then. And that's just because it you know it turns out to be the case that the profit rate is so low. I mean, it has it hit zero is a theoretical issue, I suppose, but but it's gotten low enough that uh, it's just more sane uh, for money to invest in crypto than it is into productive. Uh, but, you know, into anything productive or anything real in the economy. And that's just got to be a problem. Um, I mean, so either you destroy yeah. a lot of capital or you don't. And if you don't, right, if you're unwilling to make society poorer, then any supply shock is going to create is going to create inflation. That's precisely what's happened. You, They have no tools to like, you know, like price caps uh, to be able to combat it. And therefore, they have to start to deflate the bubble that they created but the bubble is the thing that's supporting the system and its well, political structure the, the thing that complicates it is both china and japan are also going to try to keep their bubble but in a, a must reduced capacity they're both running inflationary um monetary policies right well, well china's i mean japan's not running truly inflationary monetary policies. the other thing is like what leftists have put their hope on is the, you know the great I shouldn't say leftist and generic. I should say a certain sector of Marxists have put their hope on China as as the great socialist reformer. And while I I am mildly defensist on China when we talk mm -hmm. about like compared to other states, I'm going to say that like no, they have a business cycle now, which oh, also yeah. me means that now that they have a business cycle that you guys have been basing this off of an early industrial cycle. You just didn't realize that the early industrial cycle really started in the seventies. Um, they and... also had a real estate crash, right there. In fact, they're, they were trying to do, uh, you know, a little bit of this work of disinflating problem. They've had bank problems. runs too. Like they've and had a couple true. of bank runs. Like it's They're susceptible to all of it actually now, which is which which isn't to say that there's nothing to defend in the Chinese model. There are clearly things to learn from the Chinese Revolution and its progress. But one Mostly of those from things the great proletarian cultural revolution, though, to be honest. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> lessons in steadfastness. <laughs> um, I just I, I, I know that like I, I I am you know what I'm normally associated with the with like the Trotskyist and the Marxism, but I get all weepy eyed about the great proletarian cultural revolution because it's the only time we tried to do things that have been in this. And like the minimum program, like abolishing, uh, abolishing town and country was actually attempted. Uh, okay. Like okay. Um, what else was actually attempted? Oh yeah. They actually started doing labor tokens and time accounting, not currency. Like, which you know the Soviet Union never even got around to. So it, it's they did they do it that consistently? No, they didn't even do it consistently within the country. I mean, Mao was very good on it in the country tribe, but damn, was he not really happy when it started happening in the cities? Um, but it's it's important to like take that seriously. It's also important to take some of the things that have happened since then seriously in terms of social development and etc. But um, and I'm not, I'm really worried about all the, the, the increasing bipartisan saber rattling that oh, seems clearly, I don't, I have, I'm of two minds. I do think there are people who want war, but I also think there's just a whole lot of people who can't imagine political legitimacy right now yeah, without cold war conditions. Right. And so they're Weird. really just trying to engineer it because like, well, clearly they both have, we both have nuclear weapons. We're not actually going to war. But then I'm like, yeah, but you could, though. <laughs> we absolutely could. I, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, I just don't. I think that the that our economies are too intertwined to that for that to be viable. Absolutely. Today. But that doesn't mean that decoupling isn't isn't a goal. And I take it that decoupling is also the the biggest the biggest threat. Um, that is uh, that would be that would that would lead to war most most precipitously is if we genuinely decoupled uh, if our we economy. truly decoupled. Like... But I don't. I don't know that that's possible. I mean, even in like in five years, you know, five, 10 years at minimum to be able to achieve something like significant decoupling. And there'll be a lot of wins against it too. I mean, where is Apple supposed to put together its products? We haven't yet industrialized Africa. So where no, is it supposed I think to happen? It's, I think it's going to try to do it in India. Maybe it's India. But so, again, but, uh, but chip production being tied to Taiwan is part of why this Taiwan stuff is heating up, which I don't think people will realize. Um, 
Yeah. So it's, but yes, we're, we are in interesting times, but we're in interesting times without a revolutionary movement. And to tie it back to the subject of our uh, conversation, a lot of people like to blame that on, quote, Western Marxism, unquote, um, which is a, like, when we talk about, say, American social democracy from, like, 1910 to 1930, I know what that is. Right. Um, if we talk about our 1900s and 1930. If we talk about American communism mm -hmm. from 1922 to 19, say, 65, 56. maybe 50, Fine. yeah, 56, somewhere in there, like in the, you know, because it really kind of falls apart in 56, it, it hangs on though, by protecting black intellectuals until the sixties. And then in the seventies is when it's like, yeah. it does the thing that American sex do. It drops down to 5,000 people and then sort of alternates between three and 5,000 off of student entries for forever. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, looking a lot like the Trotskyist organizations that used to critique, actually, but ironically, yeah. Um, the, the and I think I mean, you know, I predict we're seeing that with the DSA right now that it's actually going into that decoupling, dropping out phase. No one's even talking about it anymore, so it's just like. No, I totally agree with you. I think I think the DSA is just over. Uh, I, I, but I have a whole theory of how American organizations uh, work, and I also I'm laying my chips on on there being on there being some revitalized form of communism uh, institutionally in the near future. But that's just. But I'm the only one who believes that, as far as I can tell. So anyway, your point was that you know how to talk about all those Marxisms, but what the hell is Western Marxism? Yeah, what the hell is Western Marxism? Because like when we talk about Euro communism, or when we talk about American social democracy, American communism, there's delimited things to talk about. Western yeah. Marxism isn't even limited necessarily to um, Europe and the United States and Canada. It, it's, it's, it sometimes includes parts of Latin America and sometimes doesn't. Um, it's just like... You know, um, hey, you compare it to my so I, you know, uh, a, a mentor of mine in my life is Kevin Anderson, who wrote a book about about Western Marxism and included Lenin. Um, so you know, uh, if it can include Lenin, what the hell are we talking about? Um, yeah, okay. So uh, I got interested in this, by the way, just recently when I guess it was back in January or something. I noticed that Historical Materials and the Journal had uh, had published a CFP, a call for papers on a special issue on Western Marxism. And I thought, oh, wow, I, you know, at the time I was like, oh, good, that's a really, that's a nice dusty phrase. I wonder what it means. Um, and it seemed clear that from the from the call that this that this phrase hasn't really exited uh, our discourse at all. It's it's alive and well and kicking. And um, and so I revisited the book just, just, you know, to see what it was like. Now, I mean, I'd initially encountered the book like a lot of Marxists when I was really young. I was in my early 20s. Um, I, you know, bought it off the shelf thinking that this was a great intro. Um, and in fact, there's some great things about the book. Uh, its first chapter, The Classical Tradition, is a pretty fine uh, summary of secondary international Marxism. I actually used it in a seminar on historical materialism that I taught last year, mm -hmm. just that chapter. But the book's thesis as a whole is, I mean, I, I went from thinking that it was, uh, you know, a thing of the past, oh, how dusty, to thinking, wow, this is actually... It, it's, it reads as if it's willfully distorting the tradition in order to come up with a category that is just not found. It's, you know, it doesn't seem to like, you know, get to uh, history and try to slice it at the joints, but instead like Borges Kafka tries to construct its own predecessors. Um, so which book are we talking about? Are we talking about the Perry Anderson book or the Kevin Anderson book? The Perry Anderson book. No, Kevin Anderson's book is actually, I think, I think the term Western Marxism becomes so fully a, a part of the way in which Marxists talk to one another that it made sense to talk about Hegelian Marxism in general as Western Marxism. Which but is, no, Russell Jacobi also does talk about Hegelian Marxism, in which case he actually splits Mar left Marxism and right Marxism, not into how we normally do, but in whether or not one is a, phenom a phenomenology of spirit inspired Marxist, but if one is a science of logic inspired Marxist, because the 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 Korsk uh, Lukács tradition is phenomenology of spirit and the Stalin tradition is um, Stalin science, tradition. Stalin tradition is a science of logic, although it leads him to do funny things like uh, talk about the existentialist Marxists and Sartre as, as, as like left opposition as their left communists, which is hilariously wrong. Uh, admittedly, 
they were more contemporary, but I'm like, if you'd have just done a cursory review of, 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 of French communism and that Russell Jack Jacoby books actually really, really good on the period from like, uh, 1890 to like 1930. I learned some stuff about, about German communists and left communist factions from that book that I'd actually never read before, but then you, you get to the stuff that's like new leftish and he's just, he's just like taking people at face value. Yeah. You know, it does seem to break down for many of these authors that way. I, so I do mean to make a distinction between those people who use Western Marxism uh, as a category for something. Um, and in the case of, even in the case of Kevin Anderson's book, you know, uh, he's talking about Hegelian Marxism in general. And if you just throw out the word Western Marxism and replace it with Hegelian Marxism, then he is making that intellectual history about a concrete philosophical problematic that you can then trace through a number of texts. Right. This is completely different from Perry Anderson's usage of, of Western Marxism, um, which as, and I have, have, you know, lots of respect for Perry Anderson, but as an intellectual history, it's just a work of fiction. Um, the category, the category is a bunch of stuff wrong with it, but one of the first things that's wrong with it is uh, that it suggests it's opposite. Like, okay, so if there's such a thing as Western Marxism, what's Eastern? That is, what do we mean when we say the word Mar Western? And this was in the context, right, of the word Western, and we were talking about this a little bit before, the word Western had re-entered our discourse uh, in a powerful way around the Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. We say the word Western all the time, and we know exactly what the word Western means when we say it. We, may, we mean inside the NATO security umbrella. That's what Western means. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the West against Russia. Okay. Well, it seemed to me reading this book now it, with, with all that context that that's exactly what it means here. And in fact, something of, I think, an intended poignant irony in the category's name in the first place is lost on contemporary readers, that is readers today. They don't see that for, for you know, Anderson of 1977, that, you know, that, you know, Marxism in his view had become so sclerotic in official communism, and in fact, in all those places that had been touched by actually existing socialisms, that the only intellectually interesting part of it left is the Western part, that which was cultivated within the NATO security umbrella. Oh, how tragic, right? Right, yeah, it's basically like, look at all the Marxist thinking that's happened with these Lacanians, Grazians, Frankfurtians, Sartreans, he doesn't mention the Vienna Circle, but he where could have. He also uh, Altusarians, which I think is funny because he's separating that from like Marxist Leninist traditions. And I'm like, it's yeah, it's different, but it's actually trying to do the same thing. And then he has this whole thing about uh, Della Volpi Volperian Volpian. I don't even know how you say that word. Della but, Volpe, uh, but I don't know how you say it either. Yeah, he he has it as a adjective. Della Volpean, Della Volpean. Um, but, uh, and I'm like, that that current fell away. But, yeah, right. you know. Really relevant today, I think, you know. But no, it's 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 crazy. I mean, I you know, the, he picks and chooses like crazy. Now, part of it is what was available. And we just have an embarrassment of riches of what's available. It's why the measures taken exists as a podcast, because it's because there has been such, uh, you know, such availability to material. But even in his own day, it's weird that there are figures that are missing. There's no discussion for ex I mean, this is on the surface, right? There's no discussion of anything going on in Japan. There's no Ilyankov. There's no Rubin. There's nothing about Americans. It ha it's very Eurocentric. Um, it's just not clear what the criteria is for choosing what's interesting to Marxism, what's not. Yeah, actually, like Latin America doesn't exist in it either. It's, nope. It's, it, so I'm like, oh, OK, so is Latin America a part of the official Soviet Marxism? And you, you also get the we're not dealing with the Sino-Soviet split. We're not going to deal with the Sino-Soviet split. And that book is early. That book is late enough that that is relevant. Absolutely. So yeah. It, it, late it's just like because I'm like. Hey, some of what's driving this Western Marxist stuff is the split between Russia and China. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right. So you know, it's a political, it's a political text. It's a political polemic that's masquerading as a history, and it's supposed, to, it's supposed to tell you who the good Marxists are and distinguish them from the mostly unnamed bad Marxists, the ones who didn't, you know, didn't properly take up the legacy of those heroic figures, like you know, like Luxembourg. Um, uh, into the 20th century. But then of course you get faced with characters like, I mean, I've been trying to make my way through, uh, through this, through this monster. I don't know if you've, uh, so this is Eugen Varga's selected political and economic writings. 
Um, oh, wow. Varga, perfect example of someone who's neither Eastern nor Western. He is as involved, in fact, more involved in the Hungarian Soviet experience, uh, 1919, than, than was Lukács. Um, he comes out of something like the same Central European world. He's he's fluent in, in German. He, in fact, makes it to Berlin often over the course of his career. But because he's associated with just Soviet policy after, I don't know, 1922, he is lost to history and is neither Eastern nor Western. In fact, you shouldn't even know who he was. I mean, uh, that, in some ways, all of the Hungarian tradition, which is funny because you like you can tie critical theory directly back to the Hungarian yeah. uh, tradition <laughs> through through Lukács and then again later through Lakatos. <laughs> so it's oh, that's interesting. That's a good point. That's a really uh, good point. Lakatos was an actual was an actual yeah. militant. Like yeah, I knew that. Um, so it, it's it, and yet like when we talk about it, we don't talk about like it's like okay, we talk about the weirdo we talk about your weirdo official communist blocks, the actual socialist blocks, and they get some theorists uh, that you we can still talk about Graverist. We can still talk about during the heyday of, of Chinese intrigue, all the various factions have associated weirdo political positions. My favorite one is three world theory because everyone recounts it now differently than what it was recounted at the time. And I'm always like, you know, that, that the first world was the U.S. and the USSR, right? And like the second world was. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know that. I didn't even yeah. know that actually. I don't know who first formulated a three worlds theory. It's 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 uh, strongly associated with Lin Bao, and uh, really, and yeah, and it it was so. So proletarian nation theory kind of concurrently develops in both fascist Italy, and separately and unrelatedly but still very similarly in China and the Chinese Communist Party before Mao takes over. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the, there is that. And then like the other faction in the Chinese Communist Party that is, that is uh, skeptical of the Guomindong, um, but became more and more fatalistic were like, they were basically kind of Kowski Plakhanov's Leninists. Like they, they were Leninists, but they were very much in the, like, we have to economically develop, mm -hmm. uh, we got to have, but we, we also need, you know, we don't need to just do this as a, like a national project that has to be larger than that. Um, they're both opposed to the, so to, uh, interestingly to the Soviet union's emissaries of Maring and co. Um, anyway, that, that proletarian nations thesis, mm -hmm. then when you add Mao's revision, and I don't know why we don't call Mao revisionist, because he's a revisionist of a primary order. Um, more, like, well, that's not a technical term. We don't know how to use the word revisionism, actually. It's, uh, it's we, you know, that, that Measure's Taken is thinking about writing a little book, and a, 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 every chapter is going to be a different concept, and then a little genealogy of how we got to that concept, and then and to, to like turn it into a technical term. That's what term Nail It today. Down started, started with, too, was like, okay, what has tailism meant in time? Because <laughs> it means yeah. different things in different periods. Revisionism is particularly weird. Yeah, because it means it something very specific from like the Bernstein controversies to the 19, uh, th through Hilferding. Basically. Yeah, not even to 1920. Just right. it's, an, it's an 1890s thing. Right. And then, um, and it gets picked up interestingly, actually, by a lot of non Marxists in the historical school. This is something I've been researching separately. Hmm. But all these ideas come in through like Weber and Sombart and uh, Spatoff, etc., from the youngest historical school who are members of the right wing of the SPD, uh, like yeah. the part that didn't leave Wachowski when Kowski left with the with the with the United SPD. Um, they all either become liberals in Weber's case, are fascist in in uh, Sombart's case, are fascist sympathetic in Spatoff's case, but Spatoff then like towards the middle of the of the fascist experiment decides that it's totally not worth it and goes hangs out with uh joseph schopenter and bond for the rest of his life um so everyone everyone is true to form at the end of the day i think right um and what i find interesting about that is you also have like uh uh baron tonofsky um who's uh he's a, he's a menshevik um okay. who also picks up on so these are the revisionist traits and what Bantanovsky ends up is that he, he defects to the, to the Narodniks. Um, and I bring this up because basically 
you know, we talk about this and I see it always talked about in terms of Marxists that we can follow, but they, they don't follow all the, all the Marxist right. And, but by right, I don't mean fascist. I mean, like they were just the right, the more nationalist end. Uh, they tended to um, respond to Bernstein by either becoming non-inevitabilist um, yeah. or, and it's actually a lot of the non-inevitabilist who, who eventually leave. Um, although it's weird because Hilferding, for example, is a non-inevitableist. That's part of the Hilferding-Kowski debates. Um, so I bring this all up, but by the time that revision is used around around Stalinism, um, and I do see kind of how it's related to like the Namby Pamby Marxist humanism of Kusev, but um, and I say this as a person who actually like. This Khrushchev, Khrushchev was one of the better Soviet leaders. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that's a that's a heroic roster at the end of the day. But yeah. no, it's really not. But but uh, um, it's still interesting because it pretty much in the 1960s just means are you down with the with Uncle Joe or not? That's all it means. Yeah, that's all it means. Revisionism means non orthodox, but orthodox with respect to official communism. Right. But what, what's a problem with that is that while Mao is down with Uncle Joe, Mao's primary innovation is is to take the Bukharin, Lenin, Stalin dictatorship of the peasant and Worker and and worker and turn it into the primary contradiction, which is not just that the peasants can be uh, included. It's also like well, the peasants aren't even supposed to be bourgeoisified, and the issue is not we don't have to really fight our internal bourgeoisie. Um, we have to incorporate them and keep them from going comprador and helping the imperialists because imperialism is actually a bigger mode of production issue than capitalism. And I don't think when most Maoists today talk about like the, you know, the primary contradiction being imperialism, that they realize what they're doing because. Yeah. They... Yeah. Contradiction. I mean, contradiction. What do we mean by contradiction? Uh, do they mean uh, uh, the, the primary conflict? Yes. That they will... mean primary world conflict is, is imperialism, not capitalism. Yeah, and so you could have a non-imperial capitalist world, and that might be acceptable uh, on on your transition to communism, right? Even just, <laughs> right? Um, which is how they justify some of their um, political maneuverings against the Soviets in the sixties and seventies, where they're, you know, uh, making good with Kissinger, working with fascists in Latin America, <laughs> like. At the very moment, ironically, that they're actually internal to China, doing some of the most actually following the the, the early programs prescriptions, um, in the countryside that anyone's ever tried, and that contradiction is like nobody wants to deal with it, like including people who aren't necessarily Maoists. But it's like, what do you say about like, okay, well. A lot of people who want to make a big deal of sign of Soviet split are like USSR defenses, and I and I understand why one would be that. But then I'm like, but you have to like also look at the fact that Mao was delivering on goods that the USSR had given up on delivering on. Um, no, that's true. That's genuine tragedy. I take it. I take it that that contradiction, or I mean, I don't mean contradiction in that philosophical sense, but that but that you know those two things being true at once uh, is is representative of a genuine tragedy. There are many in history. Mm -hmm. Here's one that's not a genuine tragedy. It's not the case that uh that you know oh so sadly all those on you know all those east of i don't know whatever germany's eastern border is lost marxism in its vitality and all of it was taken over by by a kind of intellectual dark age and that only in the west however that's defined can we actually like trace the stream of the history, the intellectual history of Marxism? And that's where it goes to hide until, and Anderson, Perry Anderson is perfectly like explicit about this point until another revolutionary situation will lead those people, Gramsci, Coletti, De La Volpe, Althusser, et al, Adorno, maybe even Horkheimer, all of those people back, their ideas like messages in a bottle will be available 
to that generation of Marxists that are genuinely engaged in struggle. But there's nothing particularly non-revolutionary, right, or even un-Marxist about uh, about these thinkers and their output. Um, what you know, the only problem is the historical context uh, in which they were in which they were you know they emerged, and uh, those conditions were just not propitious for engagement within politics. What's What's interesting about the, the Perry Anderson book is it, it begins the transition of this idea of Western Marxism not as the Okay, so in the Anderson selective, uh, you know, historiographic reception, basically, um, there's kind of a dissonant tradition in the capitalist world that's actually keeping a vibrancy of Marxist thought alive, even if it's because it's not in power and doesn't have ties to the state. Um, but later on, his, his own categorizations specifically are used by people to say, well, that's the degenerate Marxists. They're all intellectuals. They never engage in struggle. Um, half of them probably worked for the CIA and, uh, you know, but we know like, that many of them were anti-communists. I mean, in fact, yeah. in, like Althusser is the one where it's a little difficult, but I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Adorno is an out and out cold war anti-communist. Um, you know, like many of these people, well, okay. So, you know, you, you, like Marxists often say, well, look, you know, everyone needs a, everyone needs an image of the final crisis, you know, and if you don't have an economic image of the final crisis, you need some other one, maybe an environmental one, maybe a, you know, whatever it is, you know, maybe it's a spiritual one, you know, it's just a spiritual crisis. Yeah, I mean, it's like, why did they kick, why does the Frankfurt School kick Grossman out? It's because he, he takes a, a mildly defensive stance after 1936 towards the Soviet Union. That's and right, which is exaggerated him... by his, tro by his Trotskyist translators is exaggerated, actually. Um, you know, Grossman, Grossman, who has, you know, anyway, who has, who's a career in some institutions tied to the Soviet state, like so many people, so many people who were then murdered by the Soviet state, actually. Um, but that doesn't mean that he necessarily is a died in the world Stalinist, whatever that word's supposed to mean in, in, in the first place. Um, no, you know, he's it, you know a East German guy who kind of regrets going back to East Germany and then quickly dies. <laughs> like, <laughs> like... I mean, this, it's that is what happens. So, yeah. like, I mean, I mean, he um, he's not he's himself he's Polish, but like he 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 declared he's like you know it's it's a, it's an actual Marxist state. It's German. Let's give it a try. I'm going to be the only Frankfurt School person who goes back to the East. Um, and uh, he just doesn't. He like it seems like he's sad at the end of his life, and then he dies. Like that's it. That's all we got. Like. <laughs> Um, and then he's translated by an Indian Trotskyist in 1970, which is crazy to me because That's that crazy. fucking book is published in America. It's just yes. published in German and no one bothers to translate it into English. <laughs> it's very, very crazy. It's uh, the Grossman's <laughs> legacy is, I mean, it's got to be one of the most important things, but I'll tell you, I've been reading my way through, as I say, through Varga. What's Varga's big, big, big point. He's trying to do crisis theory. He's trying to do breakdown theory. I mean, these people are. You know, they're economists. They're not economistic. I don't know what the word economistic means, just as I don't think the word positivist has a meaning. Um, instead, no, they're economist trying... means that you are saying that there's material limits to our immediate political project and go fuck yourself. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to use Lenin quotes selectively to pretend that we can just politically will anything we want to uh, into being, despite the fact the history of the Soviet Union explicitly proves that's not true. <laughs> That's absolutely the case. Also, why are you going to Lenin for that stuff? Rosa is a better writer and she has plenty more to offer you if you want to defend voluntarism or, or like political anything. I mean, this is we were talking a minute ago about uh, about Robert Brenner's article, although I imagine uh, that it's it, that Dylan Riley is the is did the bulk of the lifting uh, in the writing. But uh, either way, the, the concept of a political I mean, you know, this this idea of the like the independence and the independent agency of the political dimension. Um, has cashed out as yet another uh, yet another stages theory and yet another Pollock style post capitalism theory because now the primary means of exploitation is political subjugation and not economic or economic that is it's not the production of surplus value. Um, but it's really, really interestingly maddening. enough, it's not because we've solved the contradiction of capitalism because mm. the competition, but actually in Brenner, the contradiction of capitalism has proved out like you and I are saying, it's just that the bad guys are one, I guess. Um, <laughs> although he's unclear on who the bad guys even are, because that, that while I think, uh, not to get too off, but because we're talking about Western Marxism, but this is related. Um, I think 
that, believe it or not, I think their propositions about what socialists and the DSA are wrong about, about American politics is correct, but their their proposition about what Biden's actually doing is laughable. So the Biden, Biden, the Biden fanboying in that article is is extraordinary. They're like, I mean, oh, it's progressive, and you know, we know it's not a socialist vision, but look, it's delivering all these goods. And I'm like, is it though? Could you no? It's MSNBC brained uh, that that view of the Biden administration, uh, and and it's funny because now if you turn on, I mean, you turn on Bloomberg even or any of the like. Obviously, I've been I've been looking a, at a lot of business press recently just because it's fascinating now. But um, but you know, you I mean, business the, press the, is always fascinating. Just the, the, exactly. I mean, <laughs> I'll, look, but... <laughs> I'll never forget. You know, during the oh, this is a little bit off, but just as a side note, during the during the violence in Honduras after the after uh, Zelaya was deposed, the only place you could read about violence was not in the op ed where they were where they ran uh, you know uh, op eds in support of uh, in support of the right wingers who took over, not on the front page of the New York Times. The only place you could read about the violence in Honduras was in the business section. Something I, you know, when the moment I that was my big manufacturing consent moment, you know, as a younger man. Um, but either way, I've been watching a lot of business press and the, the number of times you hear the phrase Weimar Republic will baffle you or no, it shouldn't surprise you actually. It, it you know, it, but it surprised no, me. I, but, but I've seen it a fucking lot lately. And I, the funny thing is, uh, Stefan is I have been on the, uh, if, if you don't want a, a fascist takeover, my dear Antifa, uh, Antifa friends, um, don't create a fucking Weimar Republic. And everyone thought I was doing it the way conservatives will say that too. And what they mean is like queer shit. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I mean, incoherent political economy, my friend. Like, I don't like. That's like, right. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right. No. Okay. Well, let's talk about incoherent. Let, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's okay if we go slightly off topic because oh, we're, this is, you and I never stay on topic where we will come, we will circle around it. Like, like the great circle of history, the way, uh, the way the spiral of dialectics works. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Like, uh, yeah, uh, musicians in the audience will know, like Bruckner, I'll articulate a key area through its dominant. Um, <laughs> right. you know, instead, uh, you know, what you hear. So, OK, um, you know, we've been we've been uh, hearing a lot from the left about economic policies and what the left is supposed to endorse at a crisis time like this. And of course, I mean, you know, you turn on, I don't know, the rising points memo or whatever that is, or you, or you turn on Elizabeth Warren yelling at, uh, yelling at Jerome Powell in Congress, or, um, you know, you hear a lot, well, the Fed has broken this, the Fed needs to now lower rates again. In fact, you've got the head of the AFL-CIO saying exactly the same thing. The Fed's gone too far, raised rates too fast. And what's incredible about that is on what kind of economic theory do they imagine themselves being, you know, basing themselves on? It's already the case that bourgeois economists don't have a theory of inflation, right? That one broke when they when they decided that monetary policy, you know, maximally eased monetary policy could just exist forever. And then they figured out that no, maybe not. Although I think supply shocks were more more at fault for consumer inflation, right? We obviously got asset price inflation. Right. I said, um, but asset price inflation. inflation has been a whole thing since the QE, which is why the tech sector as it exists right now even exists, which is the great irony of Marxist monetary theory. Um, and, uh, not Marxist monetary theory, modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory. Um, is that they're right. The Fed can't run out of money. Of course, no, no fucking idiot thought that they, they tell that to the plebs like um, that. Include, monetarists don't really think that like no one's thought that since we got off the gold standard and we started getting off the gold standard in the fucking really in the fucking 30s. But we did, you know, like definitely by the 70s because um, we started manipulating the gold standard by the by the by the Britain Woods Agreement. But right. That's right. Varga talks about exactly this, by the way, but go yeah, on. Yeah, but I'm like, but you guys sneak into this from the war Moslerites to the Keltonites. And I know that all the MMTers will say that there's no difference between these thinkers, but there absolutely is. Even to the Hudsonite. Hudson's actually the exception. I'm going to bite them off because he actually does talk about this. Um, they, they hide the fact that 0% lending interest, it favors people who already hold capital. Right, it doesn't. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily hurt um, people with debts because it it does devalue the debts if there's some inflation. But zero percent interest favors people who already hold capital to build up rentier things. Which I'm like, of course, this is why up until this, you started seeing mainstream economists flirting with people like Nathan Tankis because 
part of their theory was good for them. And the parts that the, the left part of that theory was never going to happen. Like full, you're going to have full employment as the backstop. I mean, even war Mosler says that, although he has that at like less than a living wage deliberately. Um, um, but I'm like, you need a planned economy to do this. And I'm also like, if it's it, the only way in which it does not favor high levels of capital concentration is if you do what Keynes said and tax the rich right. extremely to soak Punitive. up the excess, that, like, right. uh, which you will not do. And, and I was also, because you would also have to slow monetary transactions anyway, you're also going to have to tax the poor um, to, to, to slow down the velocity problem that you're talking about, because that's how you explain it, inflation, which means that it's going to be politically unpopular, which is why all the Keynesians became monetarist anyway. This is why, like, the Krugmans and the Larry Summers and whatever is because they knew that the implications of Keynesian tax policy would never be accepted by anybody if they actually understood it. Well, not like, by the people who fund the state, which is the bourgeoisie, that it is right. it's capitalist investors who produce the surplus value, some of which goes in, into, goes into taxation and funds the state. That It's a bourgeois state. Right. <laughs> well, this is the thing is even they will admit, well, you know, production's what, what keeps the state afloat. I'm like, so you think that currency because of state power, because of the ability to compel taxes, which by the way, requires guns. I will add you that like in, in every example that you pull from, from nap or from chartle or from tokens, if you really think about it, mm -hmm. uh, most of them are actually colonial examples with strong, with strong external states. They don't ever talk about weak states because weak states are metalist almost inherently. Um, uh, are there an actual commodity? It's not always metal, but they're most likely metal actually just for historically. <laughs> Because metal's convertible. Um, I mean, literally, you can convert it into things and then back into a bullion by melting it. That's why, like, convertibility didn't used to be a metaphor. <laughs> like, it and used to be literal. It's a useful thing, right? Money is a commodity, which is exactly how Marx describes it. Right. Um, non commodity money, our commodity backed money is not commodity money exactly. We, we, and then, but nonetheless, all that aside, is during this period of QE, the left itself, the entire time, one would go so would be so brazen until last year saying inflation doesn't hurt the poor, which is absurd. <laughs> it's absurd. Um, uh, you know, they're like, what? Because I think their image of the poor is like middle class debt holders, and it might help you against your debt, but not if you actually figure out how much is raising all of the costs. Oh, um, I mean, every, everyone who makes under $250,000 is lumpen, as far as I can tell, by the state planners. But I live I live one block away, by the way, from uh, mm. from a bread line, from, a, you know, one of these food centers for, for, for families who are food insecure. And while the lines have gone down since the height of the, of the pandemic days, 2020, 2021, they haven't ceased. Um, so no, and they're about to go back up. Um, it, it, beyond that, I mean, the other thing that just gets me about this, it should be obvious to anyone if you think about it for 35 seconds. All right. It's like, okay, zero interest conditions is great for people who have lots of capital because they buy everything up and they have, they can turn it all into rents and then stabilize their income that way. Um, that's the only part of the whole techno neo feudal thing that, that actually holds true. What I find fucking fascinating about that is the people who are complaining about techno neo feudalism are also the people saying that we should perpetually have interest rates at a natural interest rate of 0%, <laughs> which is fucking ludicrous. Um, and, and like, yes, you're right. The state can print as much currency as it fucking wants if it's an imperial state. And that's important. Um, and the reason why it's important is people... The MMTers used to say they are getting smarter about this. You say, oh, it's ideological. That's why the small states don't do this. I'm like, oh, it's not because I have to buy shit and reserve currencies. By but the way, that's idealism. The, the reason why the state of the world is, is the way it is is because people think the thoughts that they think is just, I mean, everyone should be at least Marxist enough to dismiss that one. Uh, so bye-bye, Zizek. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, MMT. No. Um, and like, and it's really frustrating because they're... I will say that after 1960s, one thing we can fault Western Marxism for mm. is not having a coherent theory to fucking economics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mainly because even if the Pollock administrative state theory or the managerial state theory or the PMC thesis or whatever is true, which by the way, 
people don't get why I post the PMC thesis. It's not that I don't think there's elite capture and that the bourgeoisie is out in the lunch and basically letting like this subclass run everything. Um, I think that's true. Uh, yeah, sure. But um, yeah, that's the point. But, but, true. but also, it's not what Aaron Reich described. No. Like, it's like 7% of the population, not everyone of a fucking degree, and they're actual elite. And so to turn to the professional managerial class thesis as an explanation for that is to have your cake and eat it too, because you're invoking an older definition that actually isn't the one that you're actually pointing to. But when it's convenient, when liberals are doing shit you don't like, you can switch back to the old expansive definition and talk about that, even though you goddamn well know that teachers are not, that teachers and like liberal students are not actually in control of fucking society. So, no, like, no. Although are they are more likely, <laughs> they're more the, 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 those people who are identified as in the PMC are, the, it is more important that they be ideologically doctrinated than others with, with less power to like say access to the press or something. But even more than that, they're more likely to have encountered their Marxism through Perry Anderson's Western Marxism. <laughs> right. So it's all, it's all kind of, it, it yeah. all gets to this, this cul-de-sac, which, which, which actually that, that in and of itself is why right wingers like to promote this grand GM theory, which I also find hilarious while we're talking about this, because this really does come back to this Western Marxist. So like, well, the Western Marxists, they're the cultural Marxists. Right. Yes. Um, and, and I used to say there is a tiny kernel of truth to that in so much that because of different kinds of state capital theses, there was a general assumption that, well, the contradictions of capital have been figured out by Keynesianism. Now we just have to take the political reins. Mm -hmm. um uh or it was the hotel grand abyss assumption well we lost in world war ii so like we have to do something else um right history is uh, over in the bad way and we're all headed toward hell and you know right, but right. that's okay because we have atonal music to help us feel better about it right uh, exactly so those are but those are the two you know and ironically they're represented in the same school of thought um by different members of that school of thought um and I'm not saying there, like, I think there's some genius in Pollock actually that, that needs to be gone back and, and rediscussed. But the idea, what I keep pointing out to these people is like, well, if Pollock is correct, we should not still be having profitability crises. And we do. We do. And and the other thing that we can say about incoherent stuff, since the, the, the domination of Western Marxism, whatever the fuck that is, this non category, um, is that. The other thing that I have seen is that it's Marxologists themselves who are most likely to say, after MMTers, who mm. don't even believe that probability is really a thing. Um, uh, I mean, they kind of do, but but the, 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 they don't believe in value at all. Like, they don't believe in value. That's true. Right. So, like, like there's no conception of value it, 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 at most. Some of them are, are power as value people. And I think those are the people who take the QE thing seriously. Uh, like Hudson, um, even though he's not, he's not, a he, he's not like one of the, he's not one of the thinkers, but if you look, read his theory of super imperialism from the seventies, hmm. it presages the, 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 the Nissan, um, um, power, power is value thesis in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, the power, which is interesting because it, it that's another one. There's no, well, either there are two things you can replace uh, economic determinism with political and cultural. Mm -hmm. And their version, and they can be versions of one another. Um, the, the, the political one is the power one, I take it, and the cultural one is the ideal, ideological one. Uh, the power one is the better one. Of course, uh, power is always articulated in some material terms, which will have to mean effective control over certain material things and therefore cashes out as, as economically relevant in the first place. But the second interesting thing is, is that their notion of capitalism must be, it must be the case that, that whatever they think capitalism is, it doesn't regulate production. It just, it just does the work of domination. Right. That's the problem that I have with their theory is like, it does explain it does explain how fiat currency works, for example, in in the modern world in a way that like Marxist commodity money doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't explain the way the actual markets work once you look at market exchanges and not just get caught up in the nominalization of currency. And 
my whole thing is right now, now I'm in a currency and fictitious capital. And you want to know who gets mad? MMTers get mad when I say the word fictitious capital. They don't believe that's a thing. So sure, like it's valorizable. Right. I'm like, no, it's not. If you all tried to valorize it, even if it's a very rich, tried to valorize all of it at once, it would not be valorizable. Like, like that's right. It is a token at the end of the day, which means that it's backed up by something. In this case, uh, in this case, it's dead, and it's backed up by polit- by by military power. Large, I mean, military in the larger sense of the of the phrase, of violent, the, you know, monopoly of violence. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not regulating production in exactly the way that we that we and that is it, it exists as a function of the state uh in order to in order to smooth the gears of capitalist exploitation well, although what's I... weird is that when capitalist exploitation runs runs aground as a result of our own just absurd amounts of uh, well to a certain extent absurd amounts of productivity um then you know what <laughs> uh it's no it's no good unless it's running the exploitation system, because if this exploitation system runs aground, it feeds on itself and just blows up like it blows up like a tulip, which is what we're what we're living through right now. I mean, what, what we're discovering is even people I knew and I was one of these people just a week ago who was like, we need to be cautious. These are this is a this is a fracture sign. And now I'm like, well, all you people who said that shit was contained are just wrong. Like I was, I was eating popcorn. I got to tell you, I've been from the moment this happened, the moment SVB happened and it hit my, you know, whatever my cell phone. Uh, I've been, I, it's, it's odd that I take such delight, you know, in, in these moments. Cause obviously people, real people suffer or have the potential to suffer. But, um, but it was like, it was, it was confirming for me. I was just so tired of, you know, a lot, many years of even just the other day, I ran into some people who were also Marxist randomly actually at a bar in LA. Um, you know, Marxist professor types and and we were having wonderful, I mean, we agreed on all kinds of things, except when it came to the idea that breakdown was even possible. Um, I mean, around the table, everyone around the table, except for me, thought that we could just float, you know, we'll float debt forever. And that's, you know, we have to instead completely reconceive of our revolutionary strategy. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, we're at the beginning of, of this, of this, you know, this rollback. And that's going to be deeply destabilizing politically, economically. It's going to, I mean, this is the classical idea of Marxist crises happening before our eyes. You know, let's suit up. Uh, we, <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine who's in the Platypus Affiliated Society. And I say that as a caveat because we all know what the Platypus Affiliated Society can be like. However, we were talking about like one of the things about the return to Marx. I was like, the funny thing about the return to Marx is like immediately before it was even popular, we had given up on Marx. And it was the only one of the few things I agreed with Doug Lane on that, like one of the history of Marxism is figuring out how people deviated from it. Now, mm-hmm. I am, you know, I'm, I'm probably more than you. There are things where I think Marx is sometimes wrong. Sure. Um, uh, so and I, I'm OK saying that. Um, but I actually think, interestingly, um, we are at a transition point and, and uh, I've been feeling this transition point for a while. And I've been being yelled at by people, by Marxists during this entire period who have told me that my concerns about profitability were like, well, that's just old, you know, dogma to, and I'm like, look, even Michael, uh, Michael Heinrich of all people, will say like, okay, he thinks that the argument in, in Capital Volume 2 about machines is bad, but that there might be empirical evidence. I'm like, there's empirical evidence, GDP growth rates decline. Now, when I say there's negative growth, people think I mean that literally. And I'm like, no, I, what I actually mean is there's decline in growth rates because negative growth in capital is a fucking collapse. That's like, right. you, can't, you cannot even, you can't shrink. You can just slow growth. Right. Like, um, and that collapse is catastrophic. We we almost really did hit it in 1975, 76, uh, 76, 77. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but there's a lot of shit that happened from 1975, 76, and 77. And then what's been interesting about this time period of the great return to Marx is that's when I started hearing people tell me for the first time in my life that mm. the events of the seventies were political choices that like we could have maintained Keynesian policies. And I'm like, stagflation was a thing. Yes. It took an endogenous shock. Whatever the fuck that means to, to really trip it off. 
there will always be shocks outside of your production cycle. So, like, the fact that that's what causes it just shows you how weak things are. The um, same thing was said of SF, uh, you know, the so Silicon Valley Bank, uh, when it was first reported, and then, you know, even in conversations in the last week, I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, they, you know, they didn't have a risk manager. They were poorly managed as a bank, et cetera. Like, I mean, you know, trying to trying to put the blame on the collapse on some kind of mismanaging. And, you know, but that doesn't explain, for example, why it needed to start to sell assets to meet the demand for withdrawals. It doesn't explain why there were increased withdrawals with the raising of interest rates. I mean, unless you look at the underlying capacity of the businesses that they were that they were, you know, uh, who's well, I mean, who why, why are treasury net? notes being valuable, a toxic asset? Like that's got that's got to be something people have wanted. to ask. Like, yeah. why, why is treasury notes? And I can tell you why. Like, it's because uh, banks have not the whole theory of, of Federal Reserve ha, was based off of the Volcker theory. Was and monetarism in general was based off this idea that if you slowed inflation by encouraging people to save by by making debt costly, that the banks would be more cautious in lending, which they have not mm -hmm. been, no, and backstop, but yeah, right, um, and they would pay back more in savings, um, sure, and they do not, like right. the the era of that of that kind of banking actually ends with the that's over with the end of of Brenton Woods that like yeah. and so here's what this causes this means that treasury notes being valuable means that people will want to cash out their old treasury notes because it's now like you start doing equations you're like well I can take the penalty and still make more money buying this higher percentage note they also take their savings which is getting like one percent from the fucking bank or something at best and put in a treasury note getting four or five, mm -hmm. which means that deposits go away. Yeah. Um, now, right. this means that the, the, the fundamental instrument that's supposed to hold all this together, whether you're an MMT or a, a neoclassical monetarist, is toxic for banks because it's worth money. Listen, uh, it, it's just the, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's just the end of capitalism. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, it, it, it's fine. My, it's going to be fine. My thing, uh, and maybe I'm more of a Leninist than you in this one way, is I think Lenin's right about uh, about revolutionary events and our ability to catch up with them. And I think we idiotically blew our wallet. <laughs> No, um, no, 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 no. Look, we didn't, we didn't at all. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I know what you mean, which is that we blew our wad in, in, in the Sanders, Sanders electoralism and then the, the pseudo volunteerism of the 2020 moment, which wasn't organized institutionally. Um, but I, I do feel like it's just a sobering moment. And it's also one that calls for organization. Um, so I, I just really believe in economic determinism so hard that I think that people will naturally form the organs that are relevant to their moments and that those organs can be formed with startling rapidity. I, having studied complexity theory, think that that's naive. <laughs> like, like, I just, um, Oh, I see you brought your bourgeois theorizations. It, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh no no i mean i'm kidding um but i've but been enjoying I mean, your cybernetics videos by the way that those have those have been fun but, well here's the thing um i think that there have been possibly terminal crises before i don't think mm. this is the first one mm -hmm. and so what happens to reset profitability can be dramatic now i actually right now do admit i i don't even think a war would do it so like yeah, like I. Um, I don't see one on the offing anyway no i mean well i i you know we are in a super imperialist uh moment where proxy wars can happen see ukraine but oh, yeah not a but, general crisis but, uh, not the beginning of world war three but world war three is existential and everybody knows it that's right, right. like so it's like that means 
And also, nobody has strong enough supply chains to like build their own war machine if everything fell apart, including the core of capital, believe it or not. As much as crazy amount as we spend on our military, uh, if the supply chains fell apart, I I mean, you heard about like fucking sending shit to Ukraine, taxing it. What do you think that would do? Um, total mobilization doesn't even seem possible now. No. Um, uh, and so I, I, I do think this is a moment. What, what I do think we'll see, and maybe this is maybe we more agree, is I think we're going to see some force on the right actually benefit from this at first, but then when they actually get in charge, they're going to make it way the fuck worse. I have and been I've been singing this song against against my liberal friends for a little while. I have never seen the right in more disarray. I think that they're the least threatening right I've ever encountered. I was much more frightened of George Bush than I am of Donald Trump. I'm and, not frightened of Donald Trump, and I've never been frightened of Donald Trump. <laughs> no, Donald Trump is just not not an important historical. Well, figure. here's the thing, actually. Since I used to be on the right, I can talk to it. I felt like the right has been way more fractured since I was on it, and that's mm. been. And I haven't been on the right for over 20 years. Um, mm. like I left the right when I was like 22, 23, and um, even then, I was like the Reagan coalition bought them time. Um. In Europe, they're highly divided because nationalism is highly divided. And in America, there's no there's no cohesive anything like there, which is why you get shit like, I mean, to me, why, why, why I'm actually less worried by the day as one. OK, let's say Ron DeSantis does win the country. He tries to do to the country what he's doing in Florida and it starts cracking capital. I don't know. You might have a military coup, frankly. Yeah. Like... Sure. Well, Ron DeSantis said the, the best possible thing about SVB's collapse that he possibly could if you're a communist, which is because what you're afraid of, what I'm afraid of, I mean, I said this before with the, during the during the Sanders Sanders Trump you know run, which was uh, you know if Trump comes out with Medicare for all white people, we're screwed, right? But he's not gonna, and he didn't. There was no major. And, and, and the the closest he got to it is, and this is this is one of the insights of the Brenner Riley essay that I actually think is smart. Mm. He got more and more incoherent to hide that the quasi social democratic policies he was adopting works. That's like, absolutely the case. In fact, he militated against those the very functioning of the social democratic policies. No, I, I mean when when Ron DeSantis and I think it was Ron DeSantis comes out and says, "Well, the reason why SVB collapsed is because they were too woke." Right, I and thought, then you have Josh Harley saying, "You know, SVB is too woke to fail," and I'm like, "They're not serious." They're absolutely they're not, not serious. They like, have no alternative. They have no alternative plan. They they cannot turn around and say to any fraction of the masses, we have a vision of a more prosperous future. Which is you. interesting because even the the kind of center-right corporatist types, I mean, corporate's not in like corporation. I mean, like in the old scary form of that. Yeah, the, the, uh, the scary marriage of the, yeah. yeah. That, that kind of uh, the, like Michael yeah. Lind and... Uh, and someone yeah. who's personally quite nice to me, but but has really sketchy politics, so, so Rob Amari, they're both, they're also like, this is fundamentally unserious. You don't know how this works. You need mass movements. The mass movements have to hold things accountable. Uh, that's why, you know, it was fucking Michael Lind of all people who's like, this is why FDR was FDR and not Andrew Jackson is because in FDR's time, there are mass political movements of workers and other things that can hold them accountable. Um, in Andrew Jackson's time, there is not. In Andrew Jackson's time, you get grift and stupidity. And in FDR's <laughs> time, he has to be accountable because somebody will rip him apart. Yeah. And like, you know, and I'm not an FDR lover, by the way. I, no, I, you know, I'm, no, I'm, I'm highly unpopular right. on the left for being like FDR maybe killed the left. But um it He's, is he, it's either FDR or Sanders, one of the right. two. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is actually the case yeah. that that I think Lind is right. And I'm like, and I keep on saying, why isn't a Marxist saying this? So that makes me afraid. And, you know, Josh Harley takes sometimes, uh, you know, running orders from these guys and they start sounding smart. Like when the rail thing happened and when these Palestine happened and then you had, you know, I was afraid then too. I thought they could get, <laughs> get one up on us too. I'm so glad that the, that it's become a banking crisis because they, they know how to go into an, do an Ohio town and say, look how capitalism is dumping on these, on, you know, on the poor, on our poor, you know, 
and uh, and you know it, we hate those corporations. And it's a completely different thing to say, oh, by the way, we don't understand how the economy really works, and uh, we have a, absolutely no argument uh, about about. So, I mean, uh, it's more than a more than a regressive vision. All they have is a restorationist one for a for a, a past. I mean, a past not worth recovering, not one within living memory. And uh, and if they it, yeah, and if they wanted it, by the way, their own policies make it impossible. Like yeah, sure. from yeah. Daniel Bell forward, everyone's kind of known like yeah. I mean, everybody these guys like the fifties, but they're never gonna like do what you know Eisenhower did in the fifties. So like they're they're not gonna they're not gonna give labor a real seat at the chair. They're not gonna tax marginal gains at like. 120 percent or something like it's that's just not going to happen and so th this is why trump never i was the only it's funny stefan i had this debate in 2016 in the long slow decoupling mm. of like me and tom o'brien and doug lane and tom o'brien doesn't hate each other now but mm. um was this debate like tom was like I'm listening to MMTers and Trump is going to do dark, dark MMT. And I'm like, they only ever do part of their program. And that's the part where they rack up a lot of debt and like float uh -huh. the government off of tax rebates, but they never do the other part, which is like reassure, reinvest, bring back jobs. Um, and if we were looking at trends and this is where my friend, uh, Nico Villarreal was too, was, was, too conservative and i mean that like he, he was like oh sbb is regional it's just a, and i'm like i don't know man uh, I, i'm like it feels regional and i realize this this relates to like it's downstream from the crypto bullshit because it's tied into sure. tech tech venturing but i'm going to tell you i bet we find out that there are more areas of banking tied up in this and lo and behold it's in fucking europe like right and now all the small banks are freaking the fuck out and what what i find interesting about this is it's socialists are like haha look at those small banks there and i'm like okay you think that's funny but what you don't realize is like you should be taking advantage of this cuz this is a sign of banking crisis for real but also you're just like laughing at them cuz oh the banks are getting money i'm like those are not the rich banks that are doing that the rich banks are actually getting doubly paid out because of the rewrites of Dodd Frank. They get paid first when these things are settled. Um, when you do repo borrowing from the Fed, that the, the, the first people who get paid are the large um, incorporated banks. And I'm like, and what I was pushing back on people who were talking about Glass Steagall and 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 uh, Dodd Frank, and I'm like Dodd Frank's would have prevented it. I'm like, look. <laughs> <laughs> the problems with Gla the problems with Don Franks is presaged by Glass Steagall. One, Dodd Frank with the Volcker rule. Ironically, it's the Volcker rule, but uh, Dodd Frank with the Volcker rule w literally was almost never put in place. It existed for one year, and all the major banks got exe got exempted from it anyway. Um, two, Barney Frank himself argued that 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 banks like svb ought to be exempt from his own law right it, it's just not the case that a bourgeois state can impose those kind that kind of austerity on the only section of its economy keeping it running which at this state in a highly financialized and largely fake economy that's going to mean these banks and it's going to mean these banks were invested in the most speculative assets when the only growth is in asset price inflation at the end of the day, this is, it's pretty straightforward. And what's wonderful is that what we should be saying is like, Hey, uh, you know, uh, these, these wicked people, the, the people, the wicked people on the right have no vision at all. They can't even do dark MMT. The wicked people in power, uh, can't produce what we need to survive. That is, you know, we're getting these massive shocks, these supply shocks, you know, there aren't enough eggs, there aren't enough diapers, there's not enough, you know, uh, the one factory closes and it turns out that like, you know, some 30% of the supply in the United States of X disappears, right? We have these super fragile supply chains. We can't produce this, the stuff that we need. We can produce tech firms that, that you know, with, with, you know, that produce apps for nonsense all day long. Um, the only hope 
that the people in power, you know, the demons in power can offer you is that we can go back to some infinitely growing and inflating version of an economy that is most productive in producing things that we don't need. Yeah, this is well, this this is why this is you want know, to talk about that Brenner thing again, and maybe we can talk go back to the problems of the whole category of Western Marxism because you know political Marxism is a is a Western Marxism it just comes after the book. Um, yeah. But let, let's ask ourselves a question with the whole like the one one of the primary assumptions is Bidenism is Keynesianism without growth, and I'm like immediately so it's Keynesianism that doesn't work. Yeah, obviously. Like, because the whole point of Keynesianism is that it is promotes that, growth. Is that it promotes growth. That's right. That's right. Like, in fact, you have to do these things that look like they're contrary to the self-interest of the bourgeoisie in order to support the, the system as such, because no individual member of the system is going to have the, you know, that objective view about the well-functioning of capitalism as a whole. And so it's the state's role to intervene uh, and, in fact, even create mixed economies in order to keep exploitation right. going. Right, doesn't even function also- anymore. Which is also funny because if you you hear people who want to celebrate the the biggest pro China argument, okay, and again, you and I are both not anti China. I want people to know that, but yeah. I find it ludicrous when people are like, "Well, they'll take out their discipline." I'm like, "They'll discipline a billionaire." Like you realize that fascist governments, capitalist governments before the 1980s, capitalist governments now, if it's not about financial stuff, uh, all the time discipline billionaires. Like, oh come on! You think Elon Musk is is uh, above the fray, and that at some point, if he be- gets hated enough, he'll go to prison over something? I can imagine that. I mean, they'll put a billionaire in prison in the United States right? if, he, if he's you know, annoying enough. Yes, that yes, they have more control over a few capitalists, and yes, like capitalists are capitalists are seen as junior partners in the Chinese state project, as opposed to, you know, the American project, which is nothing but, but. I'm also like, you have such a meager vision of mm. anything because that doesn't even fix, uh, you know, business cycle problems or whatever. All you're doing is saying, well, the state at least takes care of the worst excesses. And that's what socialism is. Why? Like, well, right. Uh, I mean, like, yeah. We're going to yeah. have to start building it ourselves, obviously. I mean, there will be, a, I think there will be a movement to, that, that will pick up on this line, um, if, if just because I don't think human beings will consent to starve themselves to death. Um, but we are going to enter a very turbulent, rocky time. And, uh, you know, is the American population going to consent to be poorer suddenly, within one generation, markedly poorer, mm-hmm. in order... To maintain this current fictitious, fictitious, like bubble forever economics going. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so either. And and it, I also don't know that I think that the actual people who run our country, i.e. the military, um, would tolerate it forever even. And that's that's the thing that like this is the like you, you, I don't like to say look at what you can't talk about because that which controls you because that's a bullshit quote anyway and it's not even true but i've never heard it before uh it's it's right when you're said all the time but um i will say this i remember a year and a half ago when all the liberals were like we're gonna be in civil war and and i i i I, I do that correctly because that was fucking ridiculous um and I'm like, by civil war, do you mean like days of lead? Do you mean political terrorism? I'm frankly surprised we don't have more political terrorism, to be honest. Um, we had a lot in the 90s. I think you may have forgotten. Uh, <laughs> it's more satisfying to yell at people online. I, I, I think, yeah, social media has displaced, has probably, it's probably replaced a lot of violence and for, you know, for its cathartic value. But anyway, um, that's yeah, the yeah. The point is well taken. Um, but but I just remember going at the time, like the military, the people who literally ensure that global capital exists by protecting the sea lanes. They're just going to let us fuck that all up. You you think so? And like, by the way, they don't even have to be in shape. They got robots. Like you, like, I just want you like, you're like, Oh, the American military today. They're so weak. I'm like drone, 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 Northrop Grumman drone. So like, like, um, you know, you you can think what you will, and 
so I think that the Civil War is coming, but the Civil War will not be between Democrats and Republicans. And I think that's what's just the bizarre in the in the water right now. They they just think that the people who like drag queens are going to start killing the people who don't like drag queens. And it's it's just not I, I just don't, I don't think that's a realistic vision of where we are uh, in history. Instead, it will be a, I mean, it will be a struggle for power with the state. Um, and either we get our act together and understand that we need institutions, democratic institutions to take over state functions, or we don't, and we struggle with the right for the state, uh, and, and I don't know what happens. No, well, uh, and, but, and, uh, basically I think out of that, a military junta takes over. Yeah. That, I like, that might that's totally possible. It, uh, like, like at that point, I'm like, well, the right that you think you're fighting is not the right that's going to win. Like there, <laughs> um, but look. A military juntas are only as strong as they're strong. That is that that is one military defeat of any kind, and they're and they're toast. Look what happened to the Argentine military junta. Of course, and the Argentines. They, I mean, they're horribly horribly disorganized, which is kind of ironic given their own self conception, I guess, uh, national self conception. But you know, I mean, the dirty war is just a disorganization nightmare. And then they lose they lose a, a skirmish really uh, over an island, and the whole government collapses. And then they go to prison. Many of them go to prison as a result um, of having been military junta members on human rights violations. Um, so it, it's that's not even a, a forever solution anyway. We might have dark, you know, Handmaid's Tale images. Um, but it uh, just a military takeover doesn't mean that's the end of history either. I mean, it's funny because right now I think... Um, we're talking about the Gramscians and, and this Western Marxist. I'm like, well, you know who seems to benefit from actually let's, you know, who thinks they benefit from Western Marxist conservatives. Cause they always think they're doing the Gramscian shit, like taking over universities after they don't matter anymore. Like, they are, they are tailing us. Right. It's like it's, us. it's like, yeah, this like, like they're now doing the shit that we did that didn't work. Yeah. It's great. Because it's they so think cool. that we wanted what's happening, which is just, like yeah. it's like it's like guys one i've actually been i've actually talked about this like the 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 alkalinsky community organizing works better for conservatives anyway and um and then i'm like guys literally we they think we wanted this this cultural like 70s like defeat like where you know where we all became good narcissistic hedonist because we lost our right. um and i'm like they think that was the goal the whole time <laughs> it's <think>. amazing <laughs> we're not even narcissistic hedonists i wish we had been narcissistic hedonists you know i was just i was just re watching michael pollan's rather rather well researched i think his new series on psychedelic drugs which you know we weren't even able the 1960s weren't even able to reintroduce psychedelics into the into the med, in medical research community i mean let alone we let alone as recreational as mind expanding and all of the other human properties that it has we weren't able to able to, able to do that let alone the sexual revolution we've talked about that before i mean it, we didn't and you know we couldn't do it we did it with rock and roll maybe but sex and, and so drugs what's the, not what's at all. what what do we got from the sexual revolution a bunch of kids who uh who like since the introduction of tinder like don't have sex and can't go to bars and talk to other human beings without having an anxiety attack like this is the most anti sex phobic version of society that i have lived through i think that that is impossible yeah, to the, deny. It, which which is crazy because it's more sex phobic than during the fucking aids crisis like and during the aids crisis precisely I, in fact that's we a both point. lived through that I mean, we were young but we both lived yeah. through it that's like right. yeah like i'm just like I was actually talking to to a conservative woman the other day about this, and I'm like, isn't it ironic that like we were all afraid? Of, and she she actually weirdly agreed with me. Was a little worried for the kids. Um, isn't it ironic that we were all afraid of this shit in the in the 80s, but we were not nearly as scared of human sexuality, even though we weren't. It wasn't as definitional to who we were in the same yeah. like like. I mean, the fact that, for example, I like refuse to countenance any questions about my sexuality because I don't believe in the fucking concept. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> it's like it's like like people. I've actually been told that that's a retrograde position. I'm like, go fuck yourself. 
<laughs> good luck. <laughs> Like, yeah, uh, no, we're we're at, we're at the bottom of the well. Uh, that that's that's clear to me. We didn't even do hedonism properly, and they're trying to tail end us on that end. Um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, we'll all be really. Well, what were you gonna say? Well, I mean, this is one of the insights of the Tom McGowan, not a Marxist, by the way, by any definition. Even if he thinks he mm. is, I don't think he thinks he is though. Um, nice guy, but uh, but I think he did have an insight about like, yeah, what you know, the the, the rights off entailing left wing enjoyment, but just in like the sadomasochistic parts <laughs> like in the unconsensual sadomasochistic parts it's, it's like... absolutely the case i was once so I, I i used to date a guy who liked watching episodes of, of law and order svu which i find more or less unlookable but one of the things that i noticed about it is that it would do all of these portrayals of violence of sexual violence in fact and then in this in the most you know obviously titillating way possible but it was okay because all the perpetrators went to jail at the end of the show so, you know, you could indulge and then you could lock up that part of yourself, right? And the it's whole process- literally the Hayes Code, horrible. by the way. Like, what? that's how people figured out in the 60s how to play the, the, the end of the Hayes Code. Was like, as long <laughs> as you punish the wrongdoers, you could be as solicitous as, as you wanted within you a certain framework. Like, <laughs> Yeah, right. And I take it that that's like, that's the lesson. That's that's the Handmaid's Tale lesson, right? Which is that, you know, you can do- uh, uh, actually, the repression of sexuality is, a, is an expression of sexuality. And that has been the most avant-garde and probably the most honest version of human sexuality that we've gotten on offer in the political world. There's this like, you know, no abortions and no divorce and, and you know, traditional marriage and the rest of it. That's at least avant-garde and imaginative. Whereas, you know, our our conception, which is uh, as liberal as, as you want, as long as your family looks like that of Neil Patrick Harris, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, and it's yeah, as liberal as you want, and also, uh, and they've even made polyamory suck. Like, <laughs> I know, I know, they've turned that. In, <laughs> they've ruined it all. It's terrible. I've have to, I've had to take into buying chocolate in order to enjoy myself. It's, awful. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just like, it's like, oh god, if I read another polyamory book that sounds like puns and self help, make me want to die. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah we're far we're far from charles bukowski I, i'll tell you I mean, that. you know what's funny it's just i'm like i'm like if anything if anything what it's convinced me of is not that the nietzschean left was right because I, I i think you know i am on the whole pro or anti nietzsche debates i'm actually somewhere in the center where i'm like nietzsche's a reactionary it fucking obviously uh, but he's on to some things that we need to understand. But every now and then I'm like, but Nietzsche was right about you fuckers just being like warm Dover, <laughs> secular, godless, boring ass Christian. Like, <laughs> like it's just. <laughs> well, let's, let's say that what, where we got here from, which is, which is a good Western point, Marxism. Right? I know, I know. We got right exactly Western Marxism and the and the right tailing Western Marxism. I mean, just they're trying to go, they're trying to go to bat against against you know Disney and culture and the rest of it. And and you know what? More power to them. Do it. Do culturalism, electoralism, and have no political economic theory. Do all of that. And I think that's a recipe for the right's demise. And so far, that's what it's doing. So I mean, they are right? the, the thing is that they're even becoming unpopular in their strongholds, and the only reason they can hold power is like our stupid undemocratic federal idiot system. Um, uh, and you know, I'm not. Uh, I I think you know centralization and well, you know me, I I uh, I don't like getting into the centralization versus decentralization problems. Yeah. Cause I sort of think like, it's neither <laughs> like, like, yes, of course <laughs> we need a central, a centralized planning authority to coordinate all this shit. But like, also no, like you, you're not gonna, you, there's no way to like have the super panopticon God of, of like God's plan plus a supercomputer. Um, like, <laughs> like plan everything that you know that's not what a planned economy means um wh why don't you guys learn that from capitalists capitalists clearly plan their economy you idiots like 
And uh-huh. by the way, it you know, socialism will take many forms, presumably. When, yeah. when I mean, you know, let's put it this way: I don't like to say socialism any anymore. I, I, in fact, I've started to like the phrase "council democracy" because it's and you know, because it's finally, I think, been discontinuated with anti-Bolshevism, which was where we began, which is the nineteen nineteen program, but um, which is which is basically a council communist document. How ironic is that? Um, but anyway, whatever version of council democracy the we're going to invent, really I imagine there will be multiple parts versions. of panic. That- they really like parts uh, like like i i just you know what they reject in panic hook is like his anti-nationalism uh sure um and uh something that i reject in panic hook their hatred of any forms of unions because it's too bourgeois um right. yeah uh, that's, right. that's their ultra leftism which has to do with strategy not with the goal right and i think that is lost that the critique of ultra leftism was a strategic critique um, and I actually do somewhat blame Lenin himself for that. Um, sure. Well, uh, he was so personal in his attacks. Yeah, it's weird that like Bordiga like was. I, I still, for the life of me, actually don't know why the Bordigas are in that book, other than that they were sometimes assholes. Like, <laughs> like because it's not that it's not that they they are sometimes more intransigent than, than any other group. But like, I'm like. They're not guilty of a lot of the shit that, that, the, that you guys are accusing, like, the Dutch council communists are. In fact, their problem with Lenin is, like, Lenin, you don't understand yourself. Like, we right. understand the real you. <laughs> so... Yeah, digging out the real Lenin is uh, from from Lenin's own polemics is, is uh, even even Lukács, our beloved Lukács, his good Western Marxist, born in the East, I guess whatever's whatever's the East. Actually, <laughs> I, I, the other day I encountered someone from from Central Europe who are from Poland who I would describe as coming from Eastern Europe, and he was furious with me and told me that I was uh, that I that I that I've I, noticed know. that Eastern Europe increasingly just means fucking Russia, <laughs> like it's like. <laughs> Just madness absolute uh, madness never uh, mind uh, that there are like missiles now or, or poland is now sending you know now sending planes etc so I, I don't know where you draw the boundaries and why um but yeah no i mean it's uh we've gotten into a bad way but, yeah uh, it, but i have yeah. I'm, I'm filled mm-hmm. with hope because because as much as i it, you know as much as i think that you know we need to combat the bad historiography of marxism and it's all available we're getting uh you know it doesn't look like the future of the left is going to be some really renewed version of electoralism. And if that's closed for us, that's good news. I, here's the thing. In the long array, I agree with you. In the immediate array, I think we, like, as I was telling someone literally earlier this morning, uh, the left, by reading J. McAvery and Kim Moody and misapplying it, actually reinvented the same mistakes that killed union organizing in the Mm. 70s and 80s um which is why it hasn't grown Uh, Mm. and and people like what do you mean it hasn't grown since you've all it's focused primarily on staffers it's focused primarily on national political events and the national political events are about politicizing the democratic party and yeah. and um, Kim Moody is not the case. That that is kind of the case for Jim McAvery. I, I actually think those are misreadings of them. But when you add, uh, your boy uh, Eric Blank, who uh, Blanc, who is uh, who is supposedly a neo Kautskyist. Um, why well, I was gonna say, why is Eric Blanc my boy? He's not my he, boy. He's supposedly a neo counselor. That's what I like. I, I I have told you guys. Uh, my my big. I get a kick out of this and we're going to have a whole symposium when you're on it about Trotskyism, but I'm like, yeah. you know what replaced Trotskyism? neo kalskianism It just reinvented it without the transitional program and permanent revolution. Like, How and, interesting. And w- That's an interesting view. Yeah, we should have that. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be really, really <laughs> informative, I think. I mean, because you have defensist neo kalskiist mm-hmm. you have mm-hmm. People who ignore, even though they're basing themselves off McNair, they ignore everything McNair says about siding with the socialist right. Like, yeah. they ignore it completely. That's like, to name names, that's the Bosch, Carson, Cara, Eric, uh, uh, Eric Blanc view of New I mean, they it, explicitly, that's why you have them praising the fucking, you know, um, uh, National Labor Relations Committee and shit as like more yeah. progressive than, it's just like, what are you what but they've become 
they've literally made the same mistakes of the new left in their interism. But what's different this time, um, and this is what concerns me. Um, and I think you ha you have a good answer that maybe we are going to have to learn because one thing I, a lot of people look at the the culture now and say, oh, it's moving right. And I'm like, yeah, but why does the right keep losing? If that's true, it's incoherent, and the right just is loud, like, and they're loud because they're. Like, you know, the evangelicals right now, right? Everyone's like, oh, the evangelicals. The evangelicals fucking lost. They lost. Yeah. We're primarily, like, even in terms of Christianity, we're primarily a Catholic country. <laughs> this is a dying bear mauling randomly through the court system. And yeah, it can yeah. hurt a lot of people, but it's oh, yeah, still sure. no, that's dying. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah, um, agreed. They lost so, the battle. You, so you're literally fighting the wounded the 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 wounded dying bear as it dies similarly most forms of conservatism from the tea party to the tea party's immediate astroturfness into trumpism into whatever the fuck is going on now it's been a perpetual more and more of a farce of itself yeah like in a very well way, even though he's the more serious inside man, Ron DeSantis is a fucking farce of Trump, who himself is a farce of Pat Buchanan, who himself is maybe a farce of Reagan. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm still out on what Pat Buchanan was, but right, who's the farce of Wallace? Who's a farce of? Who's like, a farce of? Yeah. Like it's just like as I as I rename my Twitter handle today, tragedy to farce is a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> um so it's just um it, it it's it's where we're at and I, I at one hand i'm like we should be scared of the damage these people do as they're flailing but you keep on mistaking flailing as winning because i guess you're dumb actually it's because you don't know who your enemy is um, well also because the enemy's standards for itself are so low I mean, we were just we were just making fun of the right just now. I mean, the, I mean, if you're measuring yourself against the right, then geez, you're a fucking right? joke. But, we, like when people are yeah, like, we need to do what the right does, and I'm like, why? Like, despite the fact that they're they're literally blowing millions of dollars down media projects that don't even seem to work. Why? Yeah, the media project, the media sphere, we is so powerful on the right. It's it's amazing. It's more powerful on the right than it is on the left. We know this from that from that Dominion lawsuit in in you know in Fox, which is which yeah. is nuts. But it's but like also that's clearly, like we I mean, know it from like the Crowder versus Shapiro wars, which is such a joke. But I'm like, literally, people are throwing multi million dollar contracts at these fuckers who can't even prove that they were profitable on the yeah. right. Like, yeah, well, with that niche audience, I'll take I'll take Crowder over Shapiro. At least Crowder doesn't 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 claim to be a classical music expert. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, you know, but I, yeah, I mean, but but the, my my big thing is like also, this is why this is like my difference from Ben Burgess because I'm like you think you're winning mm. people over by debating these clowns when these clowns are barely winning people over. No, like, I wish he'd stop doing that. I know. That's not, like, and you know what? It comes from a good place. It comes from his good, like you know, G. A. Cohen analytic Marxism instincts. We have to reach out to everybody and include everybody, and like, like all the yeah. workers can we 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 can convert them to our side. It and I'm like, you know, history is going to convert them to our side, not you. Like, That's right. The world like of necessity this, when it impinges itself. It's a it's Habermasian his view. You know, it's uh you know every one of those is a potential perfect speech act. Um. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't actually oppose it. I don't think it's misguided or anything. I like Ben Burgess, but, uh, but I, I wouldn't engage with it myself. But that was personally, I, I, I think it, here's my my stance on it, which I think is very complicated, uh, and I say this as Ben is a personal friend, like so, like um, I have been promoting him for a long time because I thought he was decent, and if we were gonna have someone doing that shit, I'd rather it be him than other people we promoted in the past who were not as decent, and. Good comradeship does matter, but um, that that caveat aside, I've always like your heart's in the right place, mm -hmm. um, but what's going to happen is it's going to drag you into debating ludicrous shit that even you realize is not going to help you, and you know, lo and behold, you know, it's like oh no, we're now talking the MAGA communists. It's just like it's like. It, it, I, and I'm just like, look, 
you know, that's the trajectory of that. People go like, well, Varn, you don't go out there. You're not like, and so parasocial figure here, I'm not going to name names because they always show up in my comments that's screaming at me and telling me how I don't have the proletarian on my side as if they don't understand that millionaires with established media legacies would always have a larger audience than a dude who's a part-time broadcaster and a public school teacher. I don't know what they get, right. but uh, <laughs> it's just, it's like real, it's like real dumb. Um, but um, that aside, um, there is a real sense in like, well, what, you know, what is your political project? And it's hard for them increasingly because they're more frustrated with the Democrats than they've ever been, mm -hmm. but they constantly get attacked for being Democrats. Um, yet they don't have a way to like revitalize their, their electoral strategy and they know it. Um, and, and yet like, they're also hated for stupid reasons. Like a lot of people get mad at Ben Burgess for him. Like, but he's not wrong. Like, like, yeah. like he's, I, you know, well, look, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we should be arguing with MAGA communists and it's not because of the size of their audience. Um, it's just because that, that debate is not going to end up with either, uh, either more <laughs> organizational strength or new strategy. It seems to me that we should be, that we should be engaging in the theoretical sphere as much as we possibly can and, and clarifying our ideas. And, but that's because we bring those ideas into concrete moments of organization, you know, uh, my own, my own, uh, my own building, right, which is attempting to to yet again fend off illegal rent increases from a hostile landlord, you know, uh, any number, just, I mean, any number of the concrete organizational activities that people are in, um, whatever they are, that's where you want to start smartly using the word revisionism and coming up with succinct ways to explain to your neighbors or your colleagues at work what you think is going on in the economy. Right, um, and not being a an ass out about it because one of the things I will say right now um, is a lot of socialists have been weirdly both downstream from progressives and asshats. So, and what, what I mean by that is like, they both don't sound like they're really offering anything separate from what a, just a standard progressive Democrat would offer. And, but they're bigger jerks about it. So like, right. Right. Um, and, and so it's totally alienating and they're not producing new theory. They're actually subsuming their theory to, to, to liberal bourgeois theory because, and I think this is true. I get pushed back for saying that people are also doing it towards the right. Like people who mm. are following right wing talking points. Like, for example, uh, I, I almost got in a fight with Doug Lane. I don't, I'm not accusing Doug Lane of following right wing talking points, but during this fight, it was like, who's who on the left is like, tailing republicans beyond maga communists and i'm like have you there's like multiple publications that are like dedicated to that now what do you, what do you right what do you what, what the, where the fuck are you like it's just like um and i guess it's because in a way he's right we do have to see even if you're working with democrats you have to see them as an enemy and not just like, oh, it's the DNC. Every Democratic official, not every Democratic partisan, because it's so like, because partisanship in America is, is like wearing a brand. Yeah, it, it's, it's not like being a member of the Communist Party. Right. right. It, 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 there's no social unity holding that. So you don't have to like lay, hey, lay mo hate up every stupid Democrat you encounter in your life. Um, but you do have to be like, even if I'm using you strategically right now, you are ultimately. An enemy. Now, that's why that's why I'm I tend to be a united frontist, but um, but even then, I'm a little bit hesitant right now because I'm like, I don't know, you guys have been too soft on these fuckers. Like <laughs> this is what we I think I said this here before. The dirty break happened. Uh they broke with us. Right. Uh so so let's but, but I mean, we, we haven't realized it. We haven't realized it's like we it's like we were scorned lovers in denial. We're Dido abandoned, trying to imagine that in fact Aeneas will return, and Aeneas will not return. Uh, and thank God, because he wasn't leading us to where we needed to go. Um, it's not going to lead to a more robust form of democracy. I, I I don't think there's anything in the American state project worth saving. There's no institution worth saving. Uh, you know, not yeah. I, I, mean, I, I think we know this from the Democrats because the most progressive move they can think to even do on race is to have a primary in South Carolina, oh, basing God. off of old black women. The mo and the most conservative. I'm like, I literally said to someone, I'm like, why don't they put it to Chicago or Detroit? Except that they're afraid of progressives. They're afraid of progressives. 
Like that's right. Th- this that's is this, absolutely right. But it's not about I, a black majority. It's about maintaining control. Look, it's I mean, about you know. maintaining control with a specific black majority. Also, you dipshits. I, I just want you to realize that when if the vision of the party is black professional women, that is less than five percent of the population. And if it's black women as a whole, it's less than eight. So it that can't be their real vision. It just cannot be unless they are totally dumb and i don't think they are i like i think that's an utter distraction that's why they can throw out people like kamala harris and Lloyd whitefoot if we accept that particularly right now right. we are tools and i think i think i think that we might be in a wilderness period for longer than you think i think there's gonna be a lot of leftists doing buzz like i think maga communism for example isn't gonna be theoretical help but it's not useful but it, it comes from an understandable place of like, well, what the fuck do we do? Sure. And there's just discourse. Now, how do we know this discourse is absurd? They've now had a year and a half long debate with everybody about whether or not baristas are proletarians. Yeah. And that that's been the most happened. important thing on their on their on their agenda. <laughs> like it's most just... most MAGA people in, in the in the US are not uh, going to be convinced by the small number of self-appointed communists in their ranks. Yeah, um, the, it's not in the nature not. of that movement. So no. we shouldn't, yeah, we shouldn't engage with it. And you shouldn't be, I mean, you know, this is the story of the French radical who sees the, the crowd pass by the cafe door and says, I've got to, I've got to find out where they're going so I can leave them. Um, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, right. No, no, I think that the, the period of electoralism is over and partisanship is a distraction. The only problem is, is, is the fault of people's imagination in knowing what to replace it with. And that can be aided with a return to a kind of, I mean, when I say neo kautskyanism all I mean is a, a version of, of revolutionary social democracy that comes before the debates about actually existing Soviet power. But that doesn't mean we forget all the lessons of, of Soviets or anything. Yeah, all we're it not means, throwing right? Lenin out entirely. Right. Like, we're not throwing Lenin out. We're, le- we're learning all the lessons. What we're not doing is choosing sides in a defensist, you know, defeatist struggle you know, at the, you know, in the world imperial realm. Right, which and we've we, already fucking lost. Uh, yeah, it's over be, now. I mean, look, the Soviet Union is gone. Soviet Union went away, right? Like, not, no one can be a Trotskyist anymore because there's no Soviet Union. Like, well, I mean, that's been, that, that's been the primary question I've had for, for 20 years. And this is my question when I kind of Trotskyist in college. I was like, you have debates over the Soviet Union. And maybe it's important for us to understand what to build in the future. But uh, why are you guys still split over these asinine things? And why are some of you like, defensist of a of a state that doesn't even fucking exist anymore and other users are like beating off to nato like um that's right because it's gonna like, keep the islamo fascists at bay like hitchens right, who was the trotskyist right, right. or the or there. the galloway trotskyist is like we've got to side with the uma to like keep <laughs> keep the the nato i'm like what like right. it, it, it's it, it you know and of course what do we get as the farce of that? Well, we get we get unreconstructed Marxist Leninism. It doesn't even claim to be Maoism anymore. Like um, that also has no. They don't even know the positions of the time period they're fetishizing. Like because they're like conflating like dung with with like almost neurotic theory sometimes. Like. It's it, it it's uh it's maddening, um, and you know I have taken like you know I used to be like on these die like we have to fight and I'm, now I'm just like you know what, um these people are gonna figure their shit out or they're not, <laughs> and um if the it it is it is kind of rational when you've been lied to about the Soviet Union forever to like just invert it for a while but they are gonna have to deal with the fact that certain things did happen and um like you know you can't retreat into a fantasy world about it and you can't deny that the purges or the sino soviet split were fucking disasters so um you're gonna have to deal with it and when you do you're gonna cut either helpful or you're gonna give up and like you know, I don't think we're, I just don't see it as a, let me put it that way. That's not a struggle that I'm worried about because it's all about the realm of ideas. And I think a whole lot of that's been moved off the table. Like, right. 
you know, how are gonna we how are we gonna run production will be the question going forward. And for that, we cannot turn to any historiography of the tradition that relies upon a conception of Western Marxism. And, oh, I brought it back to the beginning. Finally. <laughs> like uh, I mean, we've been talking about the really what I should name this children is Stefan Stefan Hamill and Varn talk about the bastard children of Western Marxism in quotation. <laughs> right. But, That's right. What Western Marxism hath wrought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's always it's always a great deal of fun to 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 banter about these things. I'm sorry we live so far away, so we can't do it over alcohol sometime. But <laughs> Yeah, although you are one of the few people I've met. I haven't actually met the Regrettable Brothers who I've known for way longer. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's... It, it's uh, it, And actually, I think it's funny because if you put uh, if you put us on the spectrum of, of pessimism to optimism, I am the Marxist center between you two. <laughs> like, That's true. I know no one more pessimistic than the Brothers Regrettable. Um, yeah. I, 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 except occasionally the they get soft on like of like missing party stuff and i'm like well you know it'd be great if we could build the stuff it would be required to build a party that matters and not like try to think we can conjure it out of the fucking air um but well you know that the, they believe in poetry you know and i wouldn't want to take that away from them uh, <laughs> mutter 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 catholic mother mutter, mutter mutter oh uh, <laughs> Um, oh um, man! Well, 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 I'm really looking forward to the debate on Trotskyism. I, I, I will, I will thoroughly prepare for that because I think yeah, because I think that's going to be it's going to be a debate on Trotskyism and sort of my like Neokowskian prove thyself is not the same thing, <laughs> like um, <Yes. laughs> because I do think as a side note, I do think like if you were to line up the Neokow tendencies, we could even tell you which tendencies they're the most like. From Trotskyism, Marxism is a big one, uh, that's but yeah, um, okay. and that's actually said by McNair himself. McNair himself thinks that the Marxist in Europe, he kind of ignores how how the Marxist in America went, uh, but the Marxist in Europe are the place are, is like the place to go. And I have a lot of friends who are like, well, the Marxist are like, of course, like look at the, that's their whole theory of like, you know you know all the cosmonaut people are like soft on mls because they're they're secretly marcius and we all know what happens to marcius they just become stalinist over time and and i'm like eh, i'm not sure that that's inherently true actually i don't um, even like those categories uh quite frankly i mean in fact that seems to be doing the wrong thing if if the theory is that that trotskyism is alive and well and and called uh, and living in neo kautskyism i don't think it is uh, uh, i think neo kautskyism i don't think it is alive and well and what I think is interesting about what I'm saying, what my argument is like, there are forms of it that fit the the kind of niches that existed for mm -hmm. Trotskyist. Um, I do not think they're the same thing. I think like theoretically they're not the same thing because they uh, they're very focused on civic on communist republicanism, um, which of course we're not. Uh, uh, but, and that's not all Neokowskiists, but it is most of them. Um, and they are very focused on, um, uh, political readings. Uh, the cosmonaut variety is very focused on political first readings of Marxism, the politics first Marxists, I think. Um, and they're also very long Dureus. Like they're, they're like, we're not going to see communism in any of our lifetimes. Revolutionary patience, I think is the right. Phrase. Yeah. The strategy of revolutionary patience and like, and where I am like, you don't have time. Like that may have made sense in like 1890, but I don't know more. Like we're in a big world historical crisis. It's the best possible time to be a communist. I'm having a great time. People should have come over and have a great time with me. <laughs> um, um, you know, and, and so um, I know I, I think it's interesting because my big thesis is like, okay, neo cows are actually other Marxist, and most of the other Marxist, they're not Marxist. Mm -hmm. And by that, yeah. I'm not I'm not one of these purists. So there's one Orthodox school of Marxism in which we belong. I think Orthodox Marxism is like a category error. But um, like, thank you, Lukash. Thank you, fucking yeah, Western right. Marxism for the whole fucking idea. But um, yeah. I do think in this in this sense that some people have dropped so much of both the stated goals of communism 
and the theories of Marxism, even from their historical traditions, that we really can't say they mean anything by it. It is just a floating signifier for them. Yeah. Um, and and I don't know that I would consider those people Marxist. I mean, like, um, and do I throw do I throw them out? I don't throw anyone out of the socialist republic. So, or actually, the council of democracy. Let's not even do the socialist republic shit. No, um, I mean it's uh, when I was in my, like early during Occupy days, we were once having this debate with a friend of mine who was doing pa Palestinian solidarity work, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and we were talking about Thomas Friedman, and uh, and one of the things that we stumbled on and liked was the idea that we wouldn't have to sh after during the revolution we wouldn't have to shoot Thomas Friedman because no one will remember who he was. And, and you know, so I'm not throwing anyone out of the bourgeois republic. Just the mechanisms which make them powerful will no longer be available to them. I, you know, there are going to be assholes in socialism. It seems to me, though, that we are going to have to go through some kind of revolutionary transformation. And the non-Marxists, the people I don't want to call Marxists, are the people who have a radically different crisis theory or no crisis theory at all. If I'm going to turn to Marxism, it's to explain breakdown. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing breakdown. So I don't get people who look around and don't. But that just might be... Just how we're this it is weird there are two things this is this is uh this is something i talked to uh off air to the the regrettable brothers about um i pointed out to them that like one of the weird things about the left right now is like every capitalist pathology we make excuses for um not that we not that it's not that it's not your fault yeah it's not your fault i don't give a shit about that but then when we go like but it's good though or you shouldn't yeah. try to change it and I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, no, I mean, yes, there will still be certain kinds of crime as an antisocial and violent behavior. Yes, there will still be mental ill. I'm not like a, a fisher in and think that like uh, there won't be mental illness under socialism and that we won't need doctors. Or something. Like, uh, right. I, I, however, I do think maybe we'll see a lot less of it. Um, and I do think we'll have sure. better means of help. Um, and I do think and better help across the board. Probably yeah, better but, health across the board. Oh, almost certainly. Like one of the things that we can see about about this current form of capitalism, and now this is where people call me a conservative, because um, this is my whole like, like I'm a communitarian, but you, we can already tell from this 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 uh, this conversation that my vision of community is like not um, <laughs> what what it's not like uh, we're gonna reinvent the the nuclear family or what it's so people think that because I like Christopher Lash, but I'm like, no, that ship has long sailed, my friend. Oh, and it's yeah, not even not even worth having. It's it, you know, it's, and it's not even I don't even think it's bad that it sailed. It's, it, are we still gonna have kinship bonds? Yes, of course. Like it just shouldn't be politically determinative of anything. Like Yeah. People like, will figure out their domestic their domestic relationships. We don't need to tutor them in anything. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, our our generation learned how to live with roommates for basically ever because they'll never own a home. So right, so uh, say like in like, you know, I, I, I five years ago I was making a joke about like about like economically necessary polyamory, but I am no longer saying it as a joke. Like I think I've actually seen it. Uh, where it's like, well, if there's four of us and we're all intimately tied together, we can afford things. Like, what all that uh, weird, you know, that there's a wonderful novel by, by a bourgeois novelist. <laughs> Oh, art, well, aren't um, most novelists bourgeois novelists? But go yeah, ahead. I know that. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, fact, bourgeois, all the bourgeoisie is now taking our ability away to read them, and also socialists tell me that's good too. So whatever. Um, oh, well, oh God, I've got to tell you. I mean, it's you know. Uh, so I, I mean, I teach college students, and you know, college students do struggle with writing, and it is the case that that they've always struggled with writing since the beginning of university. Oh yeah, but. Uh, True. But it's a new kind of struggle, I think, these days. They and it's not worse. To, like link a sentence together. <laughs> but here's here's what's not true. And I, you know, in my experience, it is not the case that what you what you have is people who struggle with formal writing because they have no respect or love for it and they don't want to to read books oh, or no, novels or be part of that. No, it's people for for you know who have been robbed of that and don't come with it to class and have, you know. And so it, 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 people want to be persuasive and argumentative prose. Right. Like the reason why they don't do novels is that before fed down their books, they're boring, but also because they no longer see any way in which it's going to help them. And, so and uh, like, that's what my students say to me. And I'm like, well, there are ways in which, I mean, then I almost sound like a fucking Victorian Matthew Arnold type, but I'm like, there are ways in which it's going to help you because it helps you model minds. And uh, you know, like yes. it, it's, 
but so do other kinds of media and it's okay. Like I am one of these people's like, yeah, it's fine to learn literature through film. Uh, although we'll also say reading is reading. Um, uh, anyway, this is, well, I just get mad when socialists are like, well, it's bourgeois anyway. We don't, I'm like, what the, f like, don't take away the few, don't, like, now that the bourgeoisie is taking away the few good things they gave us, don't <laughs> fucking, like, celebrate it because it was them who gave it to us, you idiot. Like, like, like stop God, it. damn it. Like, <laughs> that's right. That's precisely uh, right. I'm, this is why I'm Trotsky's end of the, well, not that route really, but on, on that, the debate about proletarian literature. <laughs> Oh yeah. Good yeah. lord. Well, you're gonna have to let me go cook dinner at some point. Yeah, I'm gonna let you go <laughs> cook dinner because it's it's uh getting latish over there in uh unnamed place in the west coast. Um, That's right. Uh so thank you so much for coming on. We're gonna have you on again soon. And um uh for the great actually you're a regular, you're gonna come on a fair amount because basically I think everything that's not like you get bottled up and uh I feel like you guys are so focused on the measures taken and uh -huh. I don't know how you do it with a group. I can do that by myself, but I can't talk to other people and be that focused. I'm too, uh, even the brothers regrettable can't like keep me on, on one topic for an hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's nathan and editing that's those are the two oh, it's, 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 Nate, you see, and i've noticed nathan's the one who hasn't met me and so that's probably why because <laughs> 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 like, i promise people who have tried to edit varn into like singular linear arguments have always failed like it doesn't happen like, yeah, so yeah i can only do it for like i enjoy minutes. the rip rollicking ride but, but oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's important also as a side note, and then I am going to let you go. Um, as a side note, as a, as a part of interviewers, is there's a Marxist uh, leftist like interview circuit. Um, yeah. And the only way I break people out of it is by giving them tangential space. And then they actually say some more important things than they're normally going to say, but they don't realize it. Uh, sometimes that's how I undo them. Let's not be, let's be honest. But, uh, but sure. th there, there's a reason why I do that because I'm on all these shows where we have like an hour and we got to like plow through They're like in an hour, explain all of Marxist monetary theory and modern monetary theory and their likes and differences. And I'm like, motherfucker, you can't do that. <laughs> like, I, saw, I saw you try to do that on TIR the other day and it's like, well, okay. oh, would you see me like try to like, r like run through the banking crisis of the last yes, 30 years. the whole thing as a summary. <laughs> you know, and after one of those characteristically long introductions on that show, which I do I do like because I, 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 you know, I, I listen to it while driving, but uh, but I did feel for you in that moment. I was like, oh man. <laughs> yeah, because Jason's like, cover it, cover it all and get it done in an hour and do not <laughs> answer anyone's questions but Pascal's or mine. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Oh my God! Because you want me to go all the way back to Glass Steagall, <laughs> like, like I mean, and I think we did an okay job. People like it's so dense. I'm like, yeah, I'm worried that most of you are not gonna gonna get everything that I hit on. <laughs> like, it's cool. It's gateway. It's gateway. It's a uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, catnip to to discover on on their own. I know. That's all I, had we can some, do on this I had someone remind me that like, hey, Barn. There is such a need for kidney because I'm always complaining, like we always get stuck in Mark said one on one, and that friend's like, Yeah, but you do need like militant. It was an anarchist who came on the show, but he was right. You do need militant kindergarten. And I'm like, shit. But I like that. you know, I guess you do. And it is something you have to do over and over again and build expertise. But but also, my friend, I don't teach kindergarten. <laughs> like, like that's not what I do. <laughs> no, you know, I think we need both. I think we need. I, you know, we often describe measures taken as Marxism two hundred one. And yeah, I, I, I think that there's there's something to that. You know, when I first learned critical theory, it's because I was in a graduate student course, well, a seminar, and and everyone was being really shitty to everyone else about how much they'd read, and be, and pretending that they'd read a lot more and understood certainly a lot more. Than they yeah, actually did. Liars. I, when I realized I was an English major and, and in critical theory, and I'm like, you fuckers read like a summary. And I was always behind in that goddamn class because I actually read all the books. <laughs> like, <laughs> but they bullied me into yeah. knowing what I was talking about so that I could go toe to toe with them. And I think that, that that's necessary too. So you both need militant kindergarten and you need those things that are right 
above your norm, you're like where you feel comfortable talking. Mm -hmm. So you have a sense for where you're going. Yeah. Um, I'm so with you on that. We um, and we need both in the media sphere. Like, um, so, and on that note, let's actually end this long conversation where we, I'm going to, I am going to name this Western Marxism's bastard children. Cause we just talked about the category. So that's <laughs> great. All right. Have a great night. You too, man. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.